Yeah. This is Monty in the Morning, the show Phoenix Magazine readers voted number one talk radio show in Arizona. Number one during your morning commute. Number one whenever news breaks during your day. And number one whenever and wherever you want to talk sports. Now it's time for Monty in the Morning. Hey, hey, Utah, how the heck are you? It is the Monty Show, Tuesday, August 16th, 2022. Good morning. Hi, Hello. Jake. Good Hello. To, good to see you. Uh, Micah Hanneman, former BYU safety, coming up on the show at 8.30. Uh, stick around for that. Hey, by the way, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the 2023 NBA All-Star Game is in Salt Lake City. Do the Jazz care about that? Is it a priority for the Utah Jazz to have representation there? And one rumor that won't go away about the Utah Jazz, we'll talk about that coming up. We got to talk about the Utes being number seven. One team in the AP preseason poll is wildly overrated. And oh, by the way, Deshaun Watson is negotiating with the NFL for a settlement, and Jake has nothing good to say about it. Nope. Is that about cover it? Yeah, man, that's, that's perfectly said. I feel like that about covers it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll get to it. How's your mood today? That's fine. Dealing with technical difficulties today, but it's fine. It's fine is what it is. It's fine. Uh, We are dealing with with, with, that's every day, though. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's every day. Mm -hmm. That's a drop that Jake no longer plays because he doesn't play drops. But anyway, let's get to it. Want to remind you, we're giving away a trip for two to see BYU and Notre Dame in the Shamrock Series in Las Vegas coming up on October 7th and 8th, we're going to give you two nights at the Palms Resort Hotel and Casino, two tickets to that game, and a $250 gas card to get you there. And it is all brought to you by our good friend, Devery Davis at Academy Mortgage. If you need help with a mortgage, Devery's written three mortgages for me. The guy's fantastic. I would highly recommend you go and check him out. Devery Davis, Academy Mortgage, 801 543 9666 NMLS number 278545. And the only way, Jake, to enter this contest is to go to Barbecue Pit Stop. In any of their five Utah locations, Logan, Lehigh, Layton, Murray, and uh, St. George, there's a box on the counter. It's got our beautiful little pictures on it. Yep, can't miss it. We're the most beautiful <clears throat> people on the planet. Better, I'm better looking than you. Right, of course. Okay. Jake's all business today. Drop a slip in the box. Check it out. Tell the guys at Barbecue Pit Stop you're there because of the Monty Show. Um, Enter to win their weekly Traeger giveaway. It's all good. Any of their five Utah locations or check them out online at bbqpitstop.com. Let's talk Utah Jazz basketball because, again, and I feel like we find ourselves having this conversation on a regular basis, the Utah Jazz somehow, someway, find themselves on the wrong side of this all-star game thing. We heard all, all I guess, season last year, this whole summer, all the all-star game, it's super important. We're really excited about it. Gotta have it. And now it's on the way, and people are trying to figure out how important it is to the Utah Jazz to have a starter in that game. I don't know, maybe Donovan Mitchell. But one thing is certainly clear, the Utah Jazz, Jake, don't seem to be prioritizing throwing the biggest party in the history of the NBA All-Star Game. And I wonder how important you think the game is to the Utah Jazz. Yeah, I mean, I I, I wonder that as well. I, I think that when, you know, we've spent all offseason talking about how Danny Ainge is going to handle trading Donovan Mitchell and building this team and building this roster and sort of setting up the team for success this coming season. I do wonder how how much does having representation um, at the All-Star Game in your building matter to you? And I think that Danny, I hope, is not making decisions based on having representation in the All-Star Game because I think that's just not the right way to go about it. But I do think the All-Star Game matters. I do think that, you know, it's it's great to have you know, Donovan Mitchell and before he was traded, I think a lot of people wanted to see Rudy Gobert in the, in the all-star game representing the Utah jazz. And obviously that's not going to happen now, 
But yeah, I think it's a really interesting conversation. I, I I look at this roster, and right now you've got one guy that'll 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 be there, you know. And and there's a lot of people that'll say, hey, well, he he's probably going to get traded before camp gets here. Now I think he's going to be here. I think Don's not going anywhere. I think that it's just it's a it's a long process, and there's a lot happening as we discussed yesterday. But as far as how much the All Star Game impacts Danny Ainge's decision making. That, to me, I think is not very much at all. I think the All-Star Game is, it should be anyway, a priority for people like Ryan Smith and, and the people who run promotions and make money for the Jazz, essentially, off of ticket sales and all that stuff. That side of the organization. That's who should care about it. But if I'm Danny Ainge, I'm not going about my day saying, well, you know, when I'm building this roster, I better have two All-Stars that, that are on this roster so we can have proper representation. Uh, I think Danny Ainge is, is is much more in the camp of, I need to build the best team I possibly can, and if that results in two All-Stars being in the game, that's great. If not, it is what it is. you know. But overall, I just think that the All-Star game tends to be this big thing that people kind of stress about. And they're like, like in Cleveland, you know, having having Darius Garland in that game and, and, and a couple other, other guys, like that was great for Cleveland. But I think for Utah, the priority needs to be building the best team possible regardless of the All-Star game. Yeah, I have a hard time believing Danny Ainge is making decisions based on the, based on player movement, the All-Star game. I don't think he's doing that. But one question that continues to come up across uh, basketball is, are the Utah Jazz cash-strapped? And I don't know that it is. Is it a real question? Is it a real situation? You know what? I I don't know, but I can tell you one of the questions I hear about, I heard about it yesterday, are the Jazz struggling financially? Is Ryan Smith putting money into the Jazz pipeline? Because you don't see things like a TV deal. You don't see, you know, some big production around the uniforms. And I know this seems silly, but there is no doubt that around the NBA, a lot of people were taken by surprise that the Utah Jazz didn't have some big production or didn't have some to do, if you will, about this uniform release that they did a couple of months ago now, I guess two months ago. And people are wondering why the Utah Jazz are not spending money on infrastructure. Why are the Utah Jazz not spending money on content creation, on a TV network, on a better radio setup? Why are the Utah Jazz, Jake, not spending money? It seems to be a continuing, I don't know, is concern too strong? Right. But it seems to be a continuing talking point across the NBA. Yeah, I think that, I think that you know, we've, we've, bandied about on this show about that. And I think that people expected a tech billionaire who bought a basketball team to do more on, on that side of the business. And I think that the Utah Jazz and, and, and Ryan Smith need to be need to be better about it. The Utah Jazz, you know, need to be executing on that front a lot better. I, I think that, you know, why are they not spending money? Well, it's only a couple of things. Either you don't prioritize things like a TV network or, you know, content creation or all that stuff we've talked about. So like you don't prioritize it or you don't have the money for it. Like like just business speaking, you don't have the money right now. And and I would be frankly a bit surprised if Ryan Smith didn't have the money for it. But that's kind of what people think that hey, like Ryan Ryan might be saving or he might be dealing with debt load or whatever. And my point just is if it was me I would find a way to get things like a TV deal done because that's going to make me more money to help me pay down the cost of buying an NBA franchise, you know? Like like getting my fans more involved, especially in an offseason where I don't have built-in advantages like, you know, two stars on my team that the fans all know and love and are married to and they're buying the 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 Heat Wave uniform and everything. Like you don't have that anymore. What do you have? You have a rebrand that people aren't in love with. You don't have a TV network. You don't have custom content creation. And the only content you did create, frankly, if I'm being honest, felt a little half-assed. If I'm being honest, like it didn't feel like no, I agree. You, you, it didn't feel like you had a plan. It didn't feel like you know Jordan Clarkson was really about being there for a jersey reveal. It just felt like JC was the guy you went and got. Because he's a fan favorite. And by the way, he's huge into fashion and clothing and the pregame fits and, you, and all of did that. Did you see Jordan Clarkson 
working out with Chris Brickley. In well, New yeah, York? I mean, obviously that confirms that he's going to be traded to the Knicks. Right? I, mean, I mean, how else would you view that? I, I don't know how, like, that's obviously the sourced information. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, this conversation about the Jazz. I don't think Ryan Smith is hurting for money. I think the Jazz are having a cash flow problem because I think that Ryan Smith is trying to pay down debt load. That's the only explanation that I can come up with. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, this was a billion-dollar deal by the Utah Jazz. That's never easy to do. I just, I am surprised, as as are many, that the Jazz have not done more. And, and it only makes sense that financial resources are tight right now. That's the... That's the only thing that makes sense. You've made minor improvements to the building. Okay, that's great. You have this jersey thing. And, and I don't want to make too much out of this new jersey. I, mm -hmm. I really don't. I The reason this is important and the reason I want people to embrace this, that cash flow that comes from launching a new jersey, that cash flow that comes from rebranding has to be significant because it costs you a lot of money. And it went over like a dud. The new jerseys have not been widely accepted. I think the purple mountain jersey next year, the purple that comes out, I think will do well. But this is a two-year jersey. That's it. This is not a jersey. These black, yellow, white things are not some long-term fit that goes down historically as you know a new day in Utah Jazz basketball. That's mm -hmm. not what these are. And so when we talk about the Utah Jazz and if they're cash-strapped, I do agree with you that I think the poor handling of the jersey rollout, the lack of, I don't know, the lack of drama, the convenience of it all, you know, talking to Utah Jazz staff members and sources at the team who tell me they're frustrated with a lack of resources in certain areas. I mean, this all points to an owner that is trying to recoup some of the money that he's laid out to buy the team. And I only point to... One other situation that I know that this has routinely happened in, and it's the Chicago Cubs. With the Ricketts family paying billions of dollars to buy the Chicago Cubs, they came in, splashed a bunch of cash, won the World Series, and have not spent a penny on this club since. Mm -hmm. And while Ryan Smith hasn't spent money to bring in an NBA championship, I think he is trying to get his books in line, Jake, to, to compete at that level. I don't know, yeah. but it feels eerily similar to what the, the Cubs did, only the Cubs won a World Series. Yeah, and I think that the problem is is the messaging was, hey, I'm we're here to we're here here to, you know, continue to carry the torch for LHM and we're here to, you know, continue the legacy and we're here to win championships and we're here to do all this great stuff, you know, and then it just hasn't panned out yet we're we're left a little disappointed with the jersey thing we're left a little disappointed that we have to go to timbuktu to find an easy tv channel to watch utah jazz games on that's a problem you know and and, and i don't mean to have this conversation from a negative standpoint but if we're seriously having a conversation about cash flow and like being able to do things and and what like why haven't things happened to me business sense it doesn't make sense to not do these things because you have a cash flow problem. I have news for you, Ryan Smith. Nobody cares that you have a cash flow problem. All we care about is are you winning basketball games and and can I watch those basketball games on TV? And then what would be great is if I could see what Donovan Mitchell was doing in his offseason in Salt Lake or during the season in Salt Lake. That's that's what fans want. We want the access. We want it to be easy to watch games, and we want good jerseys to buy. It's not that hard. It, it, and, and to me, I just think that that prioritizing money and paying down debt load early in your time as an NBA owner, to me, is a mistake. What you should be doing is you should be building infrastructure. You should be setting yourself up to have that long-term success. Like, hey, yeah, I understand that I'm incurring a bunch of costs. I understand that. But at the same time, on the Utah Jazz TV network or whatever the hell it would be called, whatever that would look like, <laughs> on the Utah Jazz TV network, right. I have all this advertising money coming in. I have all this viewership coming in because it's, it's a new thing that I just rolled out. Hey, Jazz fans, go to Channel 10 every single Jazz game night to find Utah Jazz basketball in Salt Lake. 
or whatever the setup is. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. Make it easy. Make it make it advantageous for people to want to work with you to promote their business on your TV network. And then maybe cash flow wouldn't be a problem. And that's why I say if you bought an NBA team knowing you were going to be tight after that billion dollar cost, unfortunately, maybe it was the wrong time to buy the team because because it's not just about acquiring ownership rights to a team. It's about being able to say, OK, I've own, I own the team now. What's that next step? What's the next jump? So now the problem is you traded away Rudy Gobert, which was a good trade, right? From a basketball perspective, big fan of that trade, love what Danny did. But from a business perspective, the problem is, is now you don't have that, that those two pillars of your organization that people can rely on. Right. And you're now Donovan Mitchell has been in the trade cycle all off season. So fans are like, well, you know, is Don even going to be here? Don doesn't want to be here. Get his ass out of here. He can leave if he doesn't want to be here. That's the sentiment. That's why I say you have problems financially if it is indeed the case that you're paying down debt load, which I don't know to be true. I don't know either, but something is amiss. Something That's, has to I mean, give. Like something yes. has to happen here. Yeah, and it's at some point, whether you whether you want to or not, I, I just think that you have to open your pocketbook. You have to, if you are completely rebuilding to get your financial house in order, which is what I think Danny Ainge has done. I think the Rudy Gobert trade was significant. Um, I think that there is a there is a growing momentum um, for a Mike Conley deal. Finally, we have a little traction on Mike Conley. I was told by NBA sources yesterday that Mike Conley has drawn very big interest from the Lakers in a three-team deal. Um, the Lakers are trying to add a shooter and a point guard, and it is believed that it is Tim Hardaway Jr. and and Mike Conley. And it would be a three-team deal, obviously, with the Lakers, Jazz, and Mavs. And that the Lakers would end up with Mike Conley from the Jazz and uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. from the Mavericks. And that the Mavericks would end up with Talon Horton Tucker and Boyan Bogdanovich from the Jazz. And that the Jazz would end up with, with first-round picks out of that deal. That is the only way that I see the Utah Jazz getting a first-round pick for Mike Conley. Mm -hmm. And really, you wouldn't be getting a first-round pick for Mike Conley. You'd be getting first-round picks for Conley and Bogdanovich. And I think it's a win-win deal for everybody involved. If the if the Utah Jazz do end up sending Bogdanovich and Mike Conley out in that deal, and Bogdanovich winds up in Dallas, Conley and Tim Hardaway Jr. Uh, you know, end up with the Lakers. Talon Horton Tucker ends up with with the the Mavericks and the Jazz end up with draft picks, that's a win. That is a win. That is that is significant money off of your books. Now, of course, you're going to have to put other players in that deal to make it work financially. But if that is the basic framework for a deal, I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know um, exactly what the appetite for the Utah Jazz is to take a bad contract in return on that. But you're not going to send out an estimated $40 million in, in salary and just get draft picks in return. I don't know that that's going to work for the three teams that we're talking about. So it'll be interesting to see what the Jazz have to do to make that happen, Jake. But uh, my feeling is that the Jazz will, in some form or fashion, end up trading Mike Conley and Boyan Bogdanovich before the season's over. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I think that would be a fine, a perfectly fine value proposition for the Utah Jazz to send those two guys out. But again, and and I don't want to have, I don't want to keep being negative about it. But I I want to put this into perspective for people. Think about how much change is coming to the club, right? Think about, okay, Gobert's gone. Potentially, if this trade were to happen, Mike Conley and Boyan Bogdanovich would be gone. So that's three of your five starters right there who are gone. And so if your owner in Ryan Smith is trying to recoup that money, yet on the basketball side, everything that the fans know and love, really, I mean, if we're being honest, right? Like, I'm not trying to exaggerate. Literally, Rudy Gobert, Mike Conley, and Boyag Bogdanovich were three of the guys that you loved. Who's the fourth guy we're not talking about? Royce O'Neal. He got shipped out earlier this year. So basically, the only guy left in your starting five is Donovan Mitchell. So if you were to make those trades from a basketball perspective, it's great. I like it a lot. I think it makes perfect sense. You're getting your picks. You're going to use those picks to get younger and more athletic. It's exactly what we've talked about for like a year that this team needs to fix. But from a cash flow perspective, from a business perspective, it's really interesting to me because if you're if you if the fan base doesn't love the jerseys, which we don't love the jerseys, right? That's definitely agreed upon. We don't love the jerseys. So you don't love the jerseys. 
you don't know who your the player is going to be that you're you're going to attach yourself to for the season. How does that work out from a ticket sales perspective? How does that work out from a TV perspective? Like that's kind of what I'm trying to get to here. If your fan base isn't plugged into the organization, isn't like, yes, I have to see, you know, Rudy Gobert versus Nikola Jokic. What what is there? What is that thing? That's yeah. my question. That's what I'm concerned about. That's an interesting uh it's an interesting summation if you will. Uh, Jesse Harsh gives us a $5 tip, says AP poll is USC underranked, and Monty, how far do you think Notre Dame will fall if and when they lose to Ohio State in week one? Also, BYU-Utah ranked properly. Well, we're going to talk about that coming up. Don't forget Micah Hanneman, former BYU uh, BYU Cougar. Cougar. Yeah, Cougar. Anybody? Okay. I'm working on it. I'm working on it, okay? Yeah, it's a sound of... Like, oh, there you go. Oh, wow. Jake did go. his job. Way to go, Millennial. Anyway, Thanks. the point Thanks. is, uh, Mike Hanneman joins us at 8.30. We'll ask him about that question, Jesse, is, you know, is 25 too low for BYU? Is 7 too high? And, yeah, I've got some thoughts on BYU. Yeah. I've got some thoughts on Notre Dame. They're going to play on the uh, 8th of October in Las Vegas, and you want to go and see that game? Make sure you go to Barbecue Pit Stop. Leighton, Lehigh, Logan, Salt Lake City, and St. George. Enter to win box on every counter. Then September 17th, that's right. September 17th, we'll have a watch party for you. Oregon and BYU at Autzen Stadium in Eugene. Uh, we'll have a bunch of uh, wings there for you. Are you ready to talk about that? Nah, not yet. Not yet. Uh, we'll have a bunch of wings for you. Um, we'll have pizza for you. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have a TV to watch the game. It you're is going, going to be smokers in live action in person. You're going to smell the greatness of the Traeger smoker. Yes. I had my neighbors all up in arms over the weekend when we were smoking pizza. And they were like, oh, that smells so good. It's like, get out, leave. Don't come over my fence. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I have an electrified fence. So no, that, you that don't. Would be what? No, you don't. Anyway, the point is, my neighbors were like, mmm. Yeah, every time you fire up the Traeger Smoker from Barbecue yeah, Pit Stop. Yeah, I know Stop, what time it is. Hell yeah. Make sure you check them out online, bbqpitstop.com. So again, go to any Barbecue Pit Stop location. Our name, faces, beauty is on the counter. Fill out the slip, drop it in the box. Then September 17th, join us at the Barbecue Pit Stop in Lehigh. We'll have a big watch party for Oregon at B or, uh, BYU at Oregon. Uh, we'll have wings, pizza, all kinds of greatness there. And then at halftime of that game, we're going to draw the winner to see who's going to Vegas to see BYU and Notre Dame in the Shamrock Series on October 7th and 8th. And take a picture while you're there. Show us, you know. Let us yeah, know that you, you know, went in, man. It may, and, and I guess if we have to bribe you, we may give you uh, a free T-shirt if you take a picture of yourself. And if you bought something at Barbecue Pit Stop, then the world's ending. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know. That would be amazing. So, yeah, a lot of football talk coming up on the show about an hour from now. Stick around for that. Let's get some of your thoughts. Gene Stream Gamer says, good morning, gents. So happy Mrs. Monty followed me back on IG. Well. Wow. She doesn't even follow me. You know, so, you know what, Gene Stream Gamer? You got the ultimate you're, Mrs. You're Monty official. follow. You're official. That's pretty I'm pimp. Real. Neville 93, my friend, good morning to you. Love you too, buddy. Kurt Meyer says, good morning. Hey, hey. Hello. Hey, hey, Steve Peterson, with all due respect. Uh, M. Alvarez <laughs> says, good morning, fellas. Can I Johnson, my guy, what's up? Top of the morning. All-stars right now, we have Don, but Clarkson can make the leap to become an all-star. I only half jokingly said that he was working out with Chris Brickley, but this point right here uh, from Can I Johnson is very well done. Mm-hmm. Jordan Clarkson is putting in work in the offseason, and he's not just hocking up threes. He is working on, you know, shooting off the bounce. He's working on mid-range jumpers. Like, you can see that Jordan Clarkson working with Chris Brickley is doing everything he can do to improve his game. And that doesn't mean he wants to go play for the Knicks, by the way, just because Chris is in New York and Donovan yeah, nice is, you know, in, in New York and stuff. Anyway, the point is Jordan Clarkson's working on his game. I agree with you, Kanai. I, I do. And Jake, I don't know what you think, but I do think that Jordan Clarkson can be an all-star. Yeah, and, and, and I'm just going to keep saying it. No one's talking about the fact that this team has a new head coach. Like, Will Hardy is going to bring a gas can to this team. And what I mean by that is you're not going to play this slow, methodical, you know, possession by possession style. That's not going to happen anymore. So guys yeah. like Jordan Clarkson are going to thrive under Will Hardy. I have no doubt about that. Yeah, I think it is one of the more fascinating discussions 
that you're going to see on whether or not you have multiple all-stars on this team. Because again, I will just sit here and say, this roster is not nearly a complete deal. It's not no. not close. I, I do think that there is a chance that Jazz add a significant name before training camp. I don't think it's a good chance, but I know that Danny Ainge is still involved in several bigger deals. I know that Danny Ainge is still involved uh, in several three-team deals. I know that Danny Ainge would like to make a significant deal that involves the picks that he got. Now, can that happen? Sure. I don't know that it will, but I do know that almost with all certainty, Mike Conley and Boyan Bogdanovich won't be here when training camp starts. I I mean, I think the Knicks are still the only avenue to get Donovan Mitchell traded, and I just I don't see that happening. Yeah. I don't. Um, Jerem Vincenzio says, excited for this episode. Really want to know if Ryan Smith cares for the all-star representation or not. Nah. I think he cares. Yeah. I just don't know how much money he's willing to spend to have multiple all-stars in that game. Look, I think the way I would verbalize it is he cares like from a person-to-person standpoint, but financially, I don't think it's the priority. That's what I would say. I, I think that I, I think that as the old saying goes, right, like let's judge people on their actions. So actions tell us that it's not a priority to have a TV network. Action tell, tells us that uh, it's not a priority to create custom video content that fans can attach to your organization with. It's just not. And, although, and, although I will say there is a pretty significant announcement coming this week around the Utah Jazz that is scheduled to be this week. Um, and that's pretty much me being a cock teaser, but whatever. The point is... <laughs> The point is yeah. um, that there is a pretty big announcement coming from, from the Jazz, operationally speaking, that is going to require a, a, an influx of cash. So I would lo- listen, I would love nothing more than to have a Jazz TV network or even to have, hey, this is the channel this year. You want basketball? You're going to this channel every single game. I would love you that. You want to watch the Utah Jazz? It's on KSL 5. Yeah. That's great. the way it should be. Yeah. I, that's not happening. I mean, it would be nice if you had a radio deal where you could hear the game. Like, it, it is it is really difficult to listen to jazz games on the radio because the signal is so bad. And I think the one thing that, that, that you know about this team is that there is a passionate fan base in Utah. And really, I think much of the mountain region belongs Thanks. to the jazz. Yeah. The fans are great. Jazz fans are phenomenal. Yeah. I just think they're they're massively underserved. Let me massively ask. I, underserved. I, I, I want to. I'm curious about this in the comments. How how do you guys feel about most of your starting five being traded to this point or not being on the team? Like, how do you feel about that heading into this season right now? Like, is it is it something where you don't feel as connected to the team? Is it something where you're like, yeah, we knew this was coming. We're just gonna have to wait and see who who they bring in. Like, I'm really curious about that because I do think the jersey sale thing. And like ticket sales and everything that every every opportunity for sales for an NBA organization is on the line right now for the Jazz. Like look around, you know, jersey sales, ticket sales. If nobody, if if I'm not going to say if no one's going to games because obviously fans are passionate and they're going to go to games. But like let's say that your attendance is lower this year because the team's not relatable to its fan base because they don't know who's playing for you. So your ticket sales are down, jersey sales are down. That means concession sales are down. Like you can kind of see how this snowballs. So that to me is what I would be concerned about if I was Ryan Smith and that that financial team. That's what I'd be looking at. But on that flip side, if you sign some guys here and you're a winning team and you make the postseason, even if you have to go through the play in, then I think you're okay. Then I think you've made your money. You're 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 in a good place. But I just think it's a very like fine line you're walking right now. Well, I would, I would, that's an interesting question. As a jazz fan, how are you feeling about the club right now? I, I think if I were a Utah jazz fan, I'd be excited. I think you're headed in the right direction very clearly financially today being August 16th. I think you're headed in the right direction. Yeah. I think you need more moves. And the, the question of are the Utah jazz cash strapped? I think that's a huge, huge question. Yes, it is. I Impactful think it is a question. A uh, big one. Uh, let's see. Giggity says, do you think Ryan Smith is committed to winning or committed to making money? Yes. I think he is committed to making as much money as possible, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
I think he's committed to winning in the long term. I don't necessarily believe he's committed to winning in the short term. Well, and the hard part is they're connected on some level, right? Like, if you think they about are. it, like, you have to be good financially to win basketball games or really to win in any sport. I mean, your example of the Ricketts in Chicago, I mean, is a, is a perfect example. This is a family that's making billions of dollars and is trying to sit here and say that they're cash strapped. So to me, I don't think we have that kind of access into the club yet. We don't have that kind of mainly because again, not to go down the rabbit hole, the media in Chicago is really hardcore on the Ricketts compared to what we have here. So we get more out of the Ricketts because they're pressed more. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, but I hope this announcement is something that will, will improve viewership opportunities and will improve um, distribution of the team. I, I think that's a must have before camp gets yeah. here. You got to have that. Yeah, we'll see. Top Chunky, good morning to you. He says, billionaires do not become billionaires by throwing their money away. Most billionaires are not Steve Cohen who pump money into a team to fulfill their passion. No, you're right. And the Mets are finally winning. Yeah. Although last night the Braves trolled the Mets so hard. Holy <laughs> cow. Um, but I think it is interesting. That's a very good analogy. Like it, Cohen's an interesting guy. You know, like look at the Wilpons. Look at, you know, like like that story with the Mets. It's very interesting how all that will play out. Uh, NY Jazz fan, good morning too. He says, it's time for Ryan Smith to make his own mark in a good way. Surround yourself with the best people and let them do their job. Steal the good ideas that worked around the league and implement them. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think he's done that to some level. I mean, I, I think Dan, the Danny Ainge, Dwayne Wade, you know, team that he's put together here. I, I, I think that's exactly what he's doing with that yeah. for sure. Yep, let's see. John Jackson says, Jake, no black shirt. Look good, Monty. Surprise us once in a while. So is he saying, you're saying you like the white shirt? or you saying No, you, you look good. He says you look good in a white oh. shirt that I should surprise people once in a while with not wearing a black shirt. Yeah, I like to keep it, you know, change it up every once in a while. I am pretty much, that <clears throat> how do I say it? I am pretty much a black t-shirt guy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not wearing a black T-shirt, I'm usually wearing a polo of some sort. Because it's all part of the plan. You know, that's just the way it is. Right. That is that is just the way it is, man. Like, yeah. you know. Yep. I, that's my wardrobe. Yeah. M-O-N-T-Y, uh, the Monty show. Yeah, what am I? I am Mark Zuckerberg, I guess I am. Guy wears the same shirt every day. Every day. So, so do I. Uh, Gene Stream says, I did miss one uh, some of the live stream, but problem fixed. Just repaired my phone for the fourth time just to hear. Oh, I'm glad you figured it out. Yeah. Good to see you, Jeans. Uh, Mike Phillips says, I did not have, quote, Jake explained business to Ryan Smith on my bingo card this morning with all due respect. <laughs> hey, and listen, I, I, you're, maybe you're right. Maybe I don't know anything about anything. I'm totally well, I don't down think that's with that, what dude. he's saying. I, 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 I think, I think what he's saying is, yeah, I, I think these are all things that Ryan Smith knows, but. I, half of me says that Ryan Smith had to take the moves they're 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 taking, making, had to make the moves they're making. I mean, you had to get your financial house in order. Trading Mike Conley goes a lot longer into getting your financial house in order, a lot deeper. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that doing, uh, to see them do that. What is wrong with my English today? I don't know. Good Lord. Uh, Canal Bon Loya says, why would Mitchell want to stick around for this? Well, because, A, the All-Star game is here. And I think, I guess one of the questions I would ask, one of the questions I would ask, does Donovan Mitchell want to be the face of the 2023 NBA All-Star Game? I wonder how important that is to him. I think it's been important, you know, when you see guys in their own building, you know, being the, the host of the NBA All-Star Game, I think it goes a long way to driving their profile. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if Donovan Mitchell cares about that even in the least. Uh, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, I don't know if he cares about it or not, but I, I would. I, I definitely would. I mean, I, I think with everything that's gone on this offseason and, and just the trade rumor mill and everything that he's, you know, dealt with, if you will, in the media, um, I yeah, I would care about it. And, and I think it'll be one of the things I'm really intrigued about when the season starts and when Don does that first media availability is what he has to say. You know, like I would expect him to be asked like, hey, man, like where what are your thoughts on this season? Where are you at? It, you know, like you've been talked about in the trade market all off season, and you're still here. You know, are you pleased about that? Are you happy being a jazz man? And then furthermore, the all star game is here. You know, what do you think about that? Are you looking forward to representing your club? Like, no. what do you you know, like I those are questions that have to be asked of Donovan Mitchell. And, and frankly, I would ask that to any star 
who was, you know, quote, hosting their all-star game, you know? If it was in L.A., you'd have to ask LeBron, right? I mean, if it was in Brooklyn, you'd have to ask KD, oh, wait, KD's going to retire. I forgot, right? Like, my point is, is that these guys have to take their image seriously. They have to take their reputation seriously. And I do think Donovan Mitchell takes his reputation seriously. I think there is a very intentional plan here not to say anything until he absolutely has to because I don't think Donovan Mitchell is the kind of guy who wants to say something and be in the headlines because of him he can't control what ESPN and get up does every single day talking about him a couple weeks ago he can't control what Woj and Winhorst and all these guys say but Don can control his game he can control the 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 programs he's at and the runs and Brickley, like he can control all that. So that's what I think he's doing. So if I'm Don, I do care about the all-star game. Just not yet. I'm focused on continuing yeah. to work. Yep. I agree with you. Please give us a thumbs up right now. Helps the channel grow. If you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe as we talk all things NBA on the Monty show. And don't forget that the, uh, the schedule was released to a certain extent. And Rudy Gobert makes his return to Salt Lake City December 9th. Big, but like, do jazz? Are jazz fans gonna boo Rudy, Rudy Gobert? No, I think he'll I get a standing so. ovation. So do I. He's no Gordon Hayward. Yeah, I, I, think, I think he gets a big ovation. Yeah, I think people think, oh, well, Rudy didn't want to leave. Like, I think the sentiment in most of the fan base is Rudy didn't want to leave, and they traded him, so we're gonna give him a standing o. That's what I think will happen. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. All right, let's get some more of your your comments in here. Caleb, good morning too. He says he doesn't want to look like a bad guy. Well, I don't know that Don or anybody else wants to look like a bad guy. I mean, this Kevin Durant situation is a pretty good example of that. I mean, if you missed it yesterday, uh, we talked about on the show that there were wild rumors around the league that Kevin Durant was going to force a trade out of Brooklyn by retiring and holding out and refusing to play for the team. He came out strong on Twitter yesterday. And said, no, I'm not going to do that. We are not retiring. I am not retiring. That's yeah, no, that's not going to happen. He says that's garbage. Yeah. This is your dude. Yeah. Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? What are your thoughts on Kevin Durant? Uh, I think that Kevin, you know, likes to it's, be on that Kev side of it's it. It's Kevy, please. Yeah, Kevy likes to be on that side of it where where he, he very much enjoys playing the, hey, the media said this, but I never said it card. And that's what he did yesterday. And I think that, you know, it... it I wouldn't put it past him. Frankly, I wouldn't put it past him to to sit out. Honestly, I wouldn't. I, I think that Kevin, I love the guy. I love the guy as a basketball player. I love his game. I love watching him in big moments. I expect him to hit big shots, and then he comes through, which is why he's my favorite player. But this whole thing in Brooklyn has really changed my perspective on Kevin. I think that, wow, that he is. Wow, really? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you can't. Like, again, I'm never going to take away from what he's done on the floor. This isn't a conversation about what you do on the floor. This is a conversation about how you're handling yourself through this whole Brooklyn situation. And I'm not going to cut this guy slack. You made the choice to marry yourself up with, with uh, Kyrie Irving. You made that choice. And I think that... That's where all of this started. How many times on this show did we talk about when this went down that this was going to be an issue? I remember having the conversation. Hey, it's Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Kyrie didn't really work out with Braun, right? They won a championship, but then Kyrie, Kyrie kind of went sideways. How? What's that going to look like in Brooklyn? Oh, well, they're best friends. It's not going to happen. It's fine. And then what do we have? We yeah. have Kyrie doing Kyrie Irving things, and that's my problem with Kevin Durant. You married up to a guy that you shouldn't have done, married yep. up to. And here's here's the tweet from Kevin Durant, in case you missed it. He says, I know most people will believe unnamed sources over me, but if it's anyone out there that'll listen, I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. This is comical at this point. Is this a PG-13 show? So Right, but, what, but I mean, you but, see what I mean. But on the face of, on the face of this tweet, yeah. Do you do you believe him? Do you buy that? I mean, yeah. I, buy, I guess I I I buy that Kevin is is very blunt on Twitter, and sometimes that comes off a, a certain way people don't like. That's what I buy. I think that that the threat of 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 retirement and all that. Yeah, I, I don't think that Kevin Durant was going to retire. I don't think he's that desperate to get out of Brooklyn. But, but I do think that he he. He does not just again. This is the same conversation with like Don and all these guys. If you say nothing, you need to be prepared for the consequences 
of what the media is going to assume because you said nothing. That's the problem here. Yeah. I, for me personally, I think this whole thing has damaged Kevin Durant significantly. I, I don't know anymore how, if you're Kevin Durant, you get away from the fact that your legacy has been crushed. I mean, I think a lot of people forget how many rings you have. I think you are largely irrelevant. Um, and then you bring this whole thing up or you don't want to play in Brooklyn anymore. And I think it puts you in a really terrible light. I mean, as as Caleb said, I mean, nobody wants to be a bad guy. But for once, and, and I think this is the first time I've ever felt this way about Kevin Durant, I think Kevin Durant's a heel. I think he's a bad guy. I think he's a villain right now in the NBA. And I don't know how you fix that. Winning. Be that's well, all. I, that's I mean, it. that's all well and good. But if you get traded... And let's say that they make this deal, Philadelphia or Boston or wherever, yeah. and you go and win a championship, you're still a ring chaser. You're still a guy that had to go somewhere else because you, Kyrie, and, and James Harden were a disaster. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I just don't know what you do. I still, and I know this is crazy, it still feels to me that if I'm the Utah Jazz, I am out chasing Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. I, I'm doing it. I am trying to get that done because I think the next place that Kevin Durant ends up, he has to succeed. Yes. He has to he he has to water the grass where he will be standing. Yes. Because he certainly has not done that in Brooklyn and I if I'm the Jazz, I'm doing everything that I can do to to make a championship contender right now here today. And I think Kevin Durant is a guy that I'd be chasing, but no matter where Kevin goes, and I know that's crazy talk, and yeah. Jazz fans, every time I say that, I know Jazz fans get upset that I say, hey, Kevin Durant should be a Utah Jazz man. I'm telling you right now, you want to win? You want to win now? Tag Kevin Durant and, and Donovan Mitchell on the same team in Utah, and you're going to win a championship in the next two years. Well, and I think for Kevin, Utah is a great landing spot, you know, like from a legacy standpoint. I mean, imagine what Kevin Durant would be able to say if, if he came to Salt Lake, won a championship, and you know, like anything after that doesn't even matter. You you left it. Uh, you left your you know your garbage trash can situation of the Brooklyn Nets behind. You go to Utah. Uh, uh, Nat, and again, like it or hate it, this is nationally how Utah is viewed as a small market where people don't want to go. I know we've bandied about. We've had discussions. That's how it's viewed. So if he goes, if he comes here to Salt Lake and plays for the Jazz and brings them a championship. That changes things. Now yeah. I think what people would say is, hey, well, that first championship you won in Golden State, while we didn't really care about that, the fact that you brought Utah a championship is crazy. Like, is absolutely crazy. And that's what I think, that's the type of situation Kevin needs to, to kind of, I'm not even going to say save his legacy because I don't think there's any saving, but to at least get it back on a more positive track. That's what you have to do. All right, let's keep talking jazz basketball. Rudy Sanchez, good morning too. He says, morning, fellas. Love seeing Pat Bev coming into town, but really hope he stays. The team needs toughness. I think Patrick Beverly be a great addition to this team, but um, it was explained to me that Patrick Beverly is going to be traded and they have a deal in place um, that as soon as he is eligible to be moved, I think the jazz are going to move him on because- Pack your shit, let's go. Well, he just doesn't fit into where they are as an organization right now. Not at least today he doesn't. Yeah. Alex Chacon, pull the trigger on a Conley bogey deal. Get more picks, flip them all for KD. That's what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, Gene Stream Gamer says, Jordan Clarkson, our Filipino pride. He really is a hard worker like every Filipino. Hard workers. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, don't disagree with that. JB Noel says, hi there from France. Hello. Well, hello. Welcome to Polly the show. Polyvou Francais. I, I, you know. Uh, Gene Stream says, hi, France. <laughs> Scott Howard says, morning, guys. If they keep Don, who are some players you think they'd target? John Collins still? I, I think that John Collins is one of those guys who's in limbo. Mm -hmm. But he feels now like a deadline deal guy to me. Um, you know, unless we get just a... Again, my my feeling is, is that September is going to be a very active month in this league. Very active. Yes. Is John Collins in that group? I don't know. I don't know. I think certainly Atlanta would like to move him. Um, I don't think Atlanta's a finished product either. I mean, I think one of the other teams that's really interesting is Toronto. Toronto's got guys that could be traded, but they're very hesitant right now to make deals. 
And I think Scotty Barnes is a an absolute not going to happen guy. Mm-hmm. You are not. If there's an untouchable in this league right now, it's Scotty Barnes. Yeah, you're not trading him. Um, but I I think there there's a lot of teams. I, you know, I've heard repeatedly that you know the, the 76ers want to upgrade. I've heard repeatedly Miami wants to upgrade. The Clippers have a big deal that they'd like to make. Like there are teams all around this league that would like to make deals, and they just haven't. And Anymore, I don't buy that it's Kevin Durant that everybody's waiting for. I don't. I think, you know, that that you just are hesitant to make a deal. The asking price is, it's so funny that the NBA is like real estate at this point. Yeah. I mean, the asking price based on, you know, value is very high. Texas, very high. Yeah. I mean, it is incredible what people are asking for. I mean, Don to the Knicks. Is a, is a really good point. I don't think there's anybody on earth who thinks Donovan Mitchell is worth three young players and six picks. No. I, I, ju- I don't. But that's what Danny Ainge has valued him at. Obviously not. So we'll see what, what happens. But I, I do think September could be a very busy month in this league. And I would expect, I think the Lakers are going to potentially be the first domino. Because I do think the Lakers are going to make a trade as soon as they can. I think they would... I don't think they'll trade LeBron or Anthony Davis, which pretty much goes without saying. I think everybody else on that roster is open for business. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that they are in a place now where they realize that you're either going to hold on to your future first round picks and likely struggle to make the playoffs this year, or you're going to trade your future first round picks and and help yourself quite a bit Mm -hmm. because that's what they're going to have to do. And I think Mike Conley and Tim Hardaway Jr. are two very good additions for them. Tim Hardaway Jr. has got to stay healthy. Yeah. I mean, it has plagued him. The number of games he has missed. It's the only reason he's not going to be in Dallas this year, just because he cannot stay healthy. So why wouldn't the Lakers add another injury-prone veteran? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Uh, Mark Rashmussen says, good morning from Daybreak, Utah. Sincerely, God bless. Jazz better get another all-star. Daybreak. (laughs) I saw it. You're my neighbor here in Daybreak. Good to see you, Mark. Yes, sir. TJ McVay says they tried it with the current roster. It didn't work. Make a move. Totally agree. Scott Howard says, Jake, I'm totally good with starting five being totally different. I just think they never should have walked down the road of trading Don. Stand firm that you're building around him my two cents. I I agree. Yeah. I don't know, man. I think, how do you turn that deal down if, if the Knicks had said yes? I just don't know how you don't do that deal. I, I really don't. I I, I think that man. I, I think that from a basketball perspective, yeah, it's hard to turn that down. But again, I now my head's really spinning on this money thing. I think this money thing is really interesting. Like like our and again, this is all speculation, you know, opinion stuff here. Like if if Ryan Smith is trying to recoup money, let's say, or just get to a better spot financially. You know, then why would the asking price be so high for Donovan Mitchell? Like, if that was the case, why wouldn't you have sent him out to save that money? Well, you you haven't sent him out, you know? Like, but then... That's what I'm saying. But then I look at, okay, well, you traded Rudy, and a lot of people are saying, oh, well, they're rebuilding because they traded Rudy. But my opinion on that was that just was a bad deal. That was too much money for not enough value. It was such an obvious move to make for this roster. So that's why I say it's really tough to know where Ryan Smith is at on this. But my hope is, you know, and again, I I, I don't know. But, like, I just hope that it's not incompetence. I hope that we're not sitting here with an owner in Ryan Smith who isn't prioritizing these things, which I doubt. I mean, I, I think that, that Ryan well. Smith is, like, really smart. I think that he's young. He's a go-getter. Like, there's a reason you were able to buy the Jazz at the age you were. Like, I'm with it with Ryan Smith, but I just don't want to be two, three, four seasons down the line here, and, you know, you've got all this talent on the floor, and you're competing for, you know, championships, let's say, with Danny Ainge and the boys, and we can't find the Jazz on TV. That would be a crying shame. That would be, and I think Jazz fans deserve better. Jazz fans deserved better than we saw with the jersey rollout. I mean, it, it really is that plain and simple. Yeah. And I think if you're talking if you're talking dollars to donuts, not paying people to come in and do a jazz jersey rollout, not paying for a TV deal, I mean, I think they're trying to save money where they can save money. 
And I think it's going to ultimately, I think they're being penny wise and pound foolish. Mm -hmm. I think it is going to ultimately come back to get them. But again, there's going to be a significant infrastructure announcement in the next 10 days. Um, I would think it would happen this week. I don't know. Um, that, that I think is, is smart, but I think that there, there is, there is a lot of business to be done in this organization. Seriously. I, I just don't know how else you can put it. And I think if you're the Knicks, you're very smart for walking away from this deal. Sean Carden says, I remember watching jazz games on K jazz TV. Seriously. Yeah, but you see what yes. I mean? Like, but you, at that time you knew that's where you should go to find it. I, it doesn't even have to be anything special. You just need that consistency. So when dude gets home from work or mom gets home from work and she wants to watch the jazz, she can flip it on while she's making dinner. That's what you're looking for. You have to know where your fans have to know where your games are. Yeah. And I think it's really sad that, I mean, there's a good percentage of jazz fan base who can't watch jazz on TV. I mean, that's a problem. I, I, and again, in your current position, you're better off doing something with KSL. You're already in bed with mm -hmm. them on the radio side. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I don't yes, know. Yes, yes. I am hoping that what we don't know is, hey, we're working on a major TV thing. We're going to do X, Y, Z. That's what I'm hoping That's for. That's perfect world. That's perfect world. Yeah, I agree. Aaron Argyle, good morning, too. He says, uh, it's exciting to see Utah Jazz management team with a strong vision. Okay, well, where's the strong vision, though? Uh, without being divided on key decisions, this is aggression we have not seen from the Jazz. The Jazz have been okay being good. But isn't this what we're talking about? Yeah. Like, where where is the aggression? What's the vision and what's the aggression? I, I, I don't completely see that. agree. That's a question I would love for you to, to answer. Yeah, Kanai Johnson says, why is it so hard for the Jazz to get a, a TV deal or streaming deal with Walmart? Has uh, has a when Walmart has a deal with Paramount? I don't know. It's a great question. And I again, don't know. all of this goes away if later this week we get some kind of announcement. You know the, about you know I, I like to call it a distribution deal because I guarantee you that Ryan Smith, if this is the announcement, the streaming will be a big part of that a, a part of that deal. I would be shocked if it was not. We'll see. I mean, you you yeah. We'll see. How about that? We'll see. Uh, John Jackson says Raptors knew that Kawhi didn't want to play there, but he they he bought them a trophy one season there. Then he was gone, but the Raptors has respect for him still. I don't disagree with that, but I don't know what you do if you're the Jazz. I don't know how financially flexible you are. How much financial flexibility do you have if you're the Utah Jazz? Yeah. My feeling is probably not a lot. I mean, I, I think that there are – listen, I'm okay if you're going to be a 35-win team this year. I'm okay with that. If mm -hmm. you're going to be a 25-win team, I'm probably not okay with that. I mean, if you're not going to compete for a, a playoff spot, I'm probably not okay with that. You know, like I think if you're the Utah Jazz, you have to find a way to compete for a playoff spot. You yes. owe your fan base that. And if you're not going to talk about the money you're not spending, I mean, I don't want to hear about tech billionaires anymore. Yeah. I don't want to hear about Qualtrics anymore. I don't want to hear about Dwayne Wade anymore. I mean, you're if you're going to win 20-something games, your G League team is more enjoyable. Your G League team is more compelling feel me? than that. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, there is nowhere, and there is significantly less value in rebuilding and winning 20 games this year. Like, that's just yeah. not something that I think the fan base has an appetite for. I don't think you have a Wrigley Field where you're going to be full no matter what. This Jazz team, if you're going to lose games, you're going to lose a ton of money. You're going to lose a ton of money. And I, I just don't think that's not what Ryan Smith has ever said he wanted to do. Yeah, That's not who Ryan Smith has ever said he wanted to be. I mean, and did you buy into RSL? and hurt yourself financially? I have no idea. I don't know. But what I do know is you've missed money-making, revenue-generating opportunities here now. Yeah. You've missed those. Like the the jazz, the jazz continue to operate like the old jazz. And that's a problem for me. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, Ryan Smith has to show me that he's doing what the Knicks did. Ryan Smith has to show me that he's taking a step away from who he's the Jazz have always been. Yeah. Show me that you're the Phoenix Suns and you're stepping away from the the same old Robert Sarver that you've always been. 
I, the Jazz have not stepped away from Gail in, in the, the job that she did while she was here. Yeah. Except now you're not trying to sell cars or movie tickets. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious on what that looks like. You know, like and I that's just, a really interesting point. Like at that time as a Jazz fan, you knew what they were trying to do. Like you understood, hey, we're not going to be good for the most part because – Basketball just isn't the priority. Are we going back to a time where you're going to the game to see the opponent, not the home team? Is that really Man, where... Man, that would be rough, dude. I don't see that that's where we're going. No. I At least I hope not. I, I just can't see... Because if you were going that route, Don wouldn't be here, right? Like Because, again, let's go back. Before the Rudy trade, we told you six, eight months before the Rudy trade happened that they had had a conversation with Don... That went something like, hey, we're going to build around you and we're going to do everything that we can do to bring a championship to Salt Lake with you at the center of that. Right? They had that conversation with Donovan Mitchell. Yes. So I just can't see a world where right now in the next three, four seasons where they're, you know, going to be a 25 win team and it's going to be embarrassing and you're not having fun at jazz games. I just don't, I, I can't believe that that would happen. No, I would agree with that uh, as well. All right, coming up an hour from now in just about an hour and four minutes, uh, Micah Hanneman, BYU uh, alum. Uh, you'll remember Micah played uh, back in the mid-2000s. Um, he will join us coming up on the show at 8.30 this morning. I'm really looking forward to talking to Micah, catching up with him. Um, you know, BYU's in a very interesting position. BYU 25th in the AP preseason poll. Um, feels a little low to me. Utah number seven feels a little low to me. CBS had Utah at four. The AP's got Utah at seven. Interesting times for Utah and BYU. We'll talk about that coming up in 15 minutes. Um, And I also want to get into this Miles Brennan LSU quarterback situation. I don't know how many people heard about this. And I know we talk a lot of NIL on this show, but Miles Brennan was supposed to be the next great thing at LSU. Mm -hmm. He retired from football yesterday, and he is keeping millions of dollars in NIL deal money. Should Should he be able to keep that? Is that the nasty dark side of NIL? I wonder. We'll talk about that coming up. Let's get some more of your comments here on the NBA. Uh, biggest stories uh, in jazz country this morning, I think, uh, without without a doubt. Um, you know, it, are, are the jazz focused on the All-Star game? Are the Utah Jazz prioritizing having multiple players in the All-Star game as we had heard? Is this why Donovan Mitchell hasn't been traded? Is this why Jordan Clarkson now is is spending his personal cash working with Chris Brickley, becoming a more well-rounded player? Are the Jazz prioritizing the All-Star game? And one of the big things we continue to hear about Ryan Smith and the Utah Jazz is it seems like there's a cash flow pl- hello, a cash flow problem with the Utah Jazz right now. I don't know. I would be shocked by that. Yeah. I would be shocked by that. Tech billionaire buys the team, lavishes cash on, you know, payroll, but doesn't have a TV deal, doesn't have a streaming deal, didn't do a full rollout of the New Jersey's. Why? Why haven't you added, you know, more infrastructure to this team? Why have you cut expenses instead of spending more to while, you know, to round out your your money making machine? But the UFC came and did a did a weekend at the Viv. Yeah, I guess so. I, I but you know what I mean? Like that's the But you see what I'm getting That's at. the interesting question. Yeah. Is it you know, like so many people were so excited about you know, the UFC and what does that really mean though? What does that really mean though? Are you putting money into your G League program to grow your your development program? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. You hired David Fisdale. Yeah. Can't tell me that's not part of it. That's what I mean. You've done a great job with with personnel and like hiring people on the basketball side that are going to take you places. But the business side is where there are question marks. The business side is where, you know, like, like you were just saying like, Man, yeah. could you ever imagine a place where the G League team is more compelling than the Jazz? I Man, mean, that I would not. be shocking, bro. That would be like crazy. I just can't. Man, I just can't see that. I, you know, like I, I don't know, man. I'd, That'd I'd, be crazy. Yep. Uh, Malik Shabazz says Amazon Prime. You can pay five dollars a month and watch your favorite team every year. Uh, I watch the Jazz or the Knicks games and live in Florida. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You can do that. But you but you see my point. You know where to go to get the content you want. You don't have that answer right now. 
That yeah. needs to be fixed. And as a Jazz fan, I would imagine that's frustrating. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, again, I watch games. I watch every Jazz game. I live in Daybreak, South Jordan. Mm -hmm. I watch every Jazz game on, on League Pass. Yeah. I do not have to watch AT&T Sportsnet. But, but I think the League Pass angle is interesting because I don't know how many people are willing to pay for League Pass right now. Like, what the times we're in and the things we're dealing with. Like, yeah. Price League of Pass. food, gas. Yeah, like, yeah. League Pass would be one of those things that I feel like would be on the chopping block if you're trying to save some dollars each month. You know, like, I think that's an interesting thing. Eric and Rowley says Mitchell's going to represent the Jazz in the All-Star game, then get traded. Well, the All-Star game is after the trade deadline, remember? Yeah. Uh, Walmart owns Voodoo Streaming Service. Paramount Plus is partnering with... Walmart owns Voodoo Streaming. Paramount Plus is partnering with Walmart, not the other way around. Okay. Either way, they have a deal. Mike Maples, good morning to you. Ryan needs to be more Mark Cuban and less Genie Bus. Ouch. Yowzer, not wrong. You're not wrong. I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with that. James Lee, good morning to you. Presuming that Jazz are going to tank next season, which I wouldn't presume. Uh, and Ainge came to an agreement about what this with the owner. Are you disappointed in both? And would you understand if Don doesn't want to be part of it? Um, if that is, let's presume in your scenario that that's the truth, I would be incredibly disappointed. Because no matter what you do, you're not going to have the first overall pick. I yeah. mean, you could be a lottery team, I guess. Sure. I mean, I, what there's, a, I mean, this coming draft, there's probably an entire 15, 16 legit NBA prospects in that draft. Yeah. I mean, Bronny's going to college. So what is that, two years away? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what, you know, who the best prospects are. Yeah. And, you know, the next two years that we're supposedly going to get pipeline with a lot of talent. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, Eric and Raleigh says, is the trade deadline before the All-Star game? It is. Uh, Ryan Brown says, good morning, guys. With my previous job, I never got to catch a live show. So I just wanted to say, keep up the great work. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate you very yeah, much. I appreciate you, man. Uh, NY Jazz fan says, all this TV stuff frustrates me because it's so obvious. I have to chalk it up to it's not as easy. Otherwise, the Jazz would have done something by now. It takes money. But doesn't that it feel like an excuse? Money. No, it takes a lot of money to build a TV thing. And I don't know. Here's the problem. If you have your own thing, again, I will use the Cubs. The Cubs have Marquee Network. Right. Right? Named after the famous Marquee in front of Wrigley Field. Right. They have to provide 24-7 programming on Marquee. That's expensive. That is really expensive. Do you have the sales infrastructure to support that? Do you have the manpower to support that? If you are supposedly cash-strapped, can the Utah Jazz support a TV channel? I don't know the answer to that question, and I'm not convinced to Hundo P that they can. Yeah. I'm not. Like, I, I look at, and this is why I say this all the flipping time, I look at Ryan Smith, I look at BYU TV, and I say to myself, how, you know how to do this. Right. You have tech billions. Are you really telling me you can't do something with your network? And I mean the network of humanity that you have. Right? Like, you know people. You're in business with people. People yes. want to be in business with you. Are you telling me, Ryan Smith, that you have no ability to create something special in your, your third tier rights, your, your digital, your streaming, your website, your social. You have to be you able can't, to. I just don't, I don't buy that Ryan Smith doesn't have the assets, resources, and connections to make something happen. I don't buy it. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. Like, are you not, are you not set up sales wise? Are you telling me that you're, you have, you're in like even corporate partnerships. It's, it's Silicon Slopes, man. Yeah. We sell this show that you're watching every single day, and trust me, there is a ton of money in the market. Well, and what did and he say? And people are willing to spend it. Yeah, and what did he say at the UFC event? It, it's so funny you bring up Silicon Slopes. That's all he talked about at the UFC event. Oh, Utah's growing, and the building's going to be full, and, and we're going to set records for the UFC, and Silicon, like, that's all he talked about, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, clearly he has, he's a, dude, he's a tech billionaire. He, he knows people, yep. you know? Like, you know people. Uh, right now, if you're watching this show, give us a thumbs up and a like. That really helps the channel grow. A couple more before we get to football here. Uh, Alex Chacon says, uh, did you see Skip Bayless getting roasted on Twitter over his brawny stuff? I did. Okay, so if you missed that, 
Bronny James had a huge dunk on a on a French player. Right. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. It's basketball. But in terms of social media content, it was a huge deal, as it should have been. Skip Bayless kind of crapped all over that. And Skip is, I, I just don't care. I, yeah. I, Skip Bayless is irrelevant. Yeah. He's ir- Stephen A. Smith came back to first take yesterday, and it was a huge story all over social media. Yeah. Well, and the fact that the girl that hosts his show with him, whose name I don't know, almost threw up on him because they had them on a boat. Why? I don't get it. I don't get it. Malik Shabazz says, you guys are so polite. When I go to Nick's podcast, it's definitely a show and we can learn from you guys. Great show. Thank you. I appreciate it. He says, you don't have a local channel that plays your games in Orlando and Miami. They show every game on local TV. That's my point, right? Like, like in, in the people, the fan, like, I don't care that it's Orlando, right? I don't care that Orlando's not good right now. What I care about, all jokes aside, what I care about is, is being able to watch Mo Bamba on a nightly basis, being able to watch the premier talent you have, like being able to watch uh, Paolo Bancaro, as an example, being able to watch these guys on a nightly basis, and I know what channel to go to, that's what I care about. Dude, I don't want to have to fight League Pass. I don't want to have to, you know, go to some random channel. I, I don't want to have to, I don't want to go to 686 on DirecTV, right? I want to go to Channel 5. Is it that hard? Like, I know it takes money. I know it takes resources. But you're not a G League team. You're an NBA team, man. Like, you want to play with the big boys. You want to be considered on the same level as the Knicks and the Lakers and, you know, the Bulls and, and all these teams. Well, these are some of the things you have to do. You, It's not good enough to just let these things slide. It's not good enough to not have a channel or to not have – inside the Knicks or inside the Jazz or inside the Lakers. It's not good enough not to have that stuff. And it's not expensive to make inside the Lakers or inside the Jazz or inside the Knicks. That's not that's not expensive. It's man hours, but really are are you really telling me that that you can't afford another hundred thousand dollar salary? Come on. That that's what I struggle Come with. Come on. This is this is a money thing. This is a money thing. And it really shouldn't be a money thing. That's why I'm struggling with this idea that the jazz are cash strapped i understand that's an individual business unit and you have a budget and i totally understand all of that yeah i'm struggling to believe that ryan smith doesn't have the money to dedicate to the jazz to run it properly so you're saying it's, a ch- it's more of a choice is what you're saying it's, i think it's, it's so a yes i think that that ryan smith is making a choice to pay his debt load down yeah. and i i understand that debt is expensive these days it is i totally get that but this is the cost of doing business. You yeah. came in barnstorming about winning a championship. Yeah. And we haven't gotten to any of that. That's all, that's all, you know, floating around in the air, you know, like it, it's not real. Like, Hey man, yeah. you know, like it, you've got, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm, I, I'm disappointed in Ryan Smith as the owner of the jazz. I'm not yet. If we get to training camp and there hasn't been a single announcement about infrastructure improvements tv improvements yeah content creation any if they i mean like it is stunning to me that the utah jazz do not employ a videographer full time that they don't have a full time video content creation department 365 how is that possible how are you and like this is a thing that's amazing me over the summer, the number one social media account pretty much is Chris Brickley. Like, when you want to know what guys are doing, you follow Chris Brickley. Yes. Your guys are working with Chris Brickley, and you're not there. Yeah. How are you not? How is Donovan Mitchell, and I, I asked this of Adidas as well, how is Donovan Mitchell not having a docu-series about his life right now? Yeah. How is a camera not following him around 365? Carmelo Anthony just announced one. Yeah, I I don't like this is the stuff that if you're the Utah Jazz, you are missing this opportunity. Yeah. You're missing this opportunity. I'm telling you right now. You are you, you're you're letting money just flow out the window because you don't want to pay a videographer 365. Yeah. And I just I I am incredibly shocked by that. I am shocked by that. Um, all right, a couple more, then I want to get to this NIL story. Riley O'Brien says, good morning, casuals. What's up, Riley? Good to see you. What's up, dude? Eric and Riley says, should the, should the Jazz 24-7 channel be called Behind the Music? 
like get it utah jazz yeah, like jazz, it's, it's the, music, note, like the it's, note well here's the thing i would have told you the, he does he's too young eric you can't make jokes like that behind the music is an old vh1 his standards don't matter yeah you're 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 a child behind the music was one of the best shows ever on vh1 okay cool anyway that's great that's really great <laughs> Good night, Johnson says with BB King playing jazz. Let's see what he that BB King is a and is a musician. It's a jazz legend. <clears throat> Nothing happened before I was born. You all know that. 1999. Right. Um, them guys are billionaires. They can afford to make local channel out there. Shake my head. You would hope so. You see what but like so that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, you know, excuse my French, an asshole about it. I'm not trying to be hardcore. I'm not trying to be hot take person about it but i but it's a pretty rough message to send to your fan base of like hey i'm ryan smith i own qualtrics i'm amazing but don't have a tv channel don't have any kind of content jersey reveal really didn't go that great you know like it's just not good messaging that's the problem hey check this out we just brought back the purple like that's one of the biggest conundrums that i think every jazz fan has to live with like forever why are we releasing a rebrand and not at the same time releasing the purple uniform? Why are you making us wait? Those are the little things that, that make me wonder about the decision-making with the Utah Jazz. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious how it all plays out. Hey, uh, if you're curious about whether or not you can afford a mortgage, you should probably call our guy Devery Davis at Academy Mortgage. Devery Davis, 801-543-9666. Devery Davis is a guy... Um, and I know that we talk about Devery Davis every day on this show, but he's a guy that we tell you he can help you. If you're thinking about buying a house, Utah is an incredibly real, competitive real estate market. Call a guy like Devery Davis. You need him on your speed dial when you're out there looking at houses because he can make you a cash buyer right now today. And by the way, I know there's a ton of listeners. I've, I've talked to a lot of you about mortgage and Devery Davis. I know there's a ton of you who don't believe you can afford a home. I bet you I talked to three, four guys a week who say, but yeah, hey, I appreciate Devery supporting you guys. I just can't afford a down payment. And I'll say to somebody, well, hey, what's a down payment? Like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. Well, actually, did you know there's FHA programs that make it far less than that? Did you know there's programs from the U.S. government that make it so you have to pay zero down? Did you know? Yeah. Did you know if you're a police officer or a veteran, it's zero down to get yourself into a mortgage? Call Devery Davis today, 801-543-9666 at Academy Mortgage, NMLS number 278545. And here's the thing that I, I will tell you as well. Devery Davis has done three mortgages for me. Devery Davis got me into a situation in this house that I live in now in Daybreak. I had multiple people to compete with. I want to say we had six or seven people to compete with to buy the house that we're in. Devery Davis made it so that I won that battle because he told me what the house was worth. He told me, hey, here's what your mortgage would be if you offered this. Here's your, your percentage rate. Here's this. Here's that. By the way, here's your cash buyer letter. So you can walk in, make an offer and say, hey, we're a cash buyer. No contingencies on getting financed. That's what Devery Davis can do for you. Call him today, 801-543-9666. And please make sure you tell Devery Davis um, that you heard about him on the Monty Show. Yeah. When when we ask you to move to an advertiser, and you notice we don't have a ton of advertisers. We're not the show that has ED and dick pills and, hey, you know, let us help you in the bedroom. We bring you advertisers who can help you in your pocketbook. Yeah. That's what this show's about. Yeah. 801-543-9666 for Devery Davis and the folks at Academy Mortgage on the Davis Lending Team. Here's a question for you. By the way, don't forget, coming up in 45 minutes, Micah Hanneman, uh, BYU alum, will join us. And I am going to ask him, is NIL already broken? Now, at BYU, you've heard all about the Bilt Bar deal. You've heard all about, you know, X, Y, and Z, all this money, two big NIL deals. But there are BYU players who are not happy about that. If you are a walk-on and you needed a scholarship, you got one from Bilt Bar. But has BYU, Utah, any college in this country, has NIL really changed the lives of the garden variety college football player or athlete? I think I can make the argument that it has not yet. 
We have not invented the wheel for NIL yet. And I only simply point you to Miles Brennan, no longer a college football player, Miles Brennan. Retired from the LSU Go Tigers. Go Tigers. From the LSU Tigers because he got beaten out for the starting job, so he quit football. You know. Miles Brennan had NIL deals with Raising Canes, Smoothie King, GameCoin, Small Sliders, and Hollingsford Richards Ford. He signed all those NIL deals. Did not take a single snap while making millions of dollars on NIL. Yeah. Should he get to keep that money? Uh, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think it depends on, obviously, the the language and the contract and everything, but on uh, just on the premise alone, yeah, I mean, I think you probably should. I mean, uh, NIL is a very slippery slope, if you will. I mean, just because you're not playing football, per se, and taking snaps doesn't mean that you didn't help those businesses bring in more business because that's the essence of nil hey we're gonna we're gonna basically give you money to represent the ford dealer we're gonna put you in an f-150 you're gonna drive around we'll make some videos on it and then we're gonna put that out and because people know who miles brennan the quarterback at lsu is and we're gonna say hey this is our ford dealer they're gonna come in and buy a car from us that's the essence of nil so yeah it would be great if if miles brennan was joe burrow-esque but he wasn't and the problem i have is not even around you know him keeping the money the problem i have is you quit football after you didn't make the starting job i've never been a fan of that like no. if you don't want to play football after you got beat out okay play through the season fulfill your commitments right and then we wouldn't have to have this conversation about whether you should be able to keep the money or not but to me the whole nil thing is really interesting because yeah if you sign an agreement, I would think in that NIL agreement, it has to say, hey, you got to at least play through the season or something, but I don't know. That's why I'm like, hey, what does the agreement say? So on premise, yeah, I do think you should keep the money, but if in the agreement it said you got to play the season, well, then that's pretty clean cut. I think this is the dirty side of, of NIL, and I think this is why you have to be able to to really, I don't want to, I, I hate the word regulate it. But on some level, you have to have protections for the company providing the money. And that's why I think it's safe for a company like Built Bar to do business with BYU. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand the black and white says they're not doing business with BYU. Built Bar's doing business with BYU, right? That's why companies like Built Bar, I think, are reticent or hesitant to do deals with Joe Blow quarterback. Right. Because you find yourself in a situation where if that quarterback gets hurt or that quarterback quits like Miles Brennan at LSU, you're just out that money. Right. And what Thanks. did you what did you really gain from it? I don't know that you really gained anything. And the hard part for NIL right now is I think it is a dirty, nasty business. I can tell you, again, I and I know we talk about this on this show all the time. I can tell you that Utah is struggling in NIL. Mm -hmm. Like I have tried and tried and tried to reach out to, to Utah football players and say, hey, let us toss you some money. Come on our show every week. We'll attach you to a sponsor. Hey, let us get you some, some money for food. Hey, let us get you cash and then a gift card. You know, let us do, let us work a deal with you. Yeah. I can't get in touch with anybody at Utah football any player, because the school can't really help you at all, I can't get in touch with a single player. We have we have got, and we'll announce it coming up in the next few weeks, we've got a BYU football player that's going to be on the show every single week. And it was not hard to do because, like at BYU, you have a, a group like Coop Connect mm -hmm. that makes it possible, that facilitates. But that's what you need. But then you hear about, hey, well, what did the players really get out of X, Y, and Z deal? What did the players really get out of this deal with this company and you hear frustration and you see that, Hey, maybe like the, the, you know, the school profits that this guy profits, but at the end of the day, is the money going into the pocket of the player or not? Mm -hmm. That's what NIL is supposed to be about. If you don't want to make college athletes employees of the university, you've got to allow them to make money outside of that. And that's what you're seeing. You are seeing situations where guys like last year, Britton Covey was the NIL broker for the football team. Who's doing that this year? Because this U team should have guys everywhere. 
and not on the flagship. I mean, everywhere on TV, they should be on billboards. Yeah. They should be on t like how many t-shirts are for sale for BYU football players. It's ridiculous. How many of those opportunities? It's ridiculous how many of, of the BYU guys have posters, have buttons, have T-shirts, have hats. But at Utah, you have nothing like that. Yeah. And again, if you're a Ute fan and I'm wrong, please step up to the plate and tell me. Because I, I feel like weekly I'm begging on the show to understand what is the issue at Utah? Why are there no bridges being built for these players? And I look at a situation like Miles Bridges and talking to advertisers around the state, there are a lot of advertisers who, frankly, are just very hesitant to marry up to teenage kids. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame them. I, re I really do not blame them. And I think one of the reasons at BYU that you see more success with NIL is there is a maturity factor. There is at BYU, you have guys that are married with kids that need to execute that need that money, that that have different priorities than than single teenage kids, 20-year-old kids who are going to the frat house at night. Yeah. And I think you have a very different climate. Now, do you have return missionaries that play at Utah? Yes. Are there players at Utah that are married with kids? Yes. Not to the level that there is at BYU. Right. There, there just isn't. And again, coming up in 40 minutes, I'm going to ask Micah Hanneman, the former uh, BYU safety, about this because I think it's a really important question. Yeah. I think when you look at NIL, it is incredibly dysfunctional. It is not the jackpot that I think people thought it would be. And I, listen, for Miles Brennan at, at LSU, and again, if you're just tuning in, LSU quarterback Miles Brennan gets beat, up, gets beat out, not going to be the starter, quits football, walks away, keeps his millions of dollars in NIL money. And maybe that was intentional, by the way. Maybe maybe you know that it was an easy choice because basically what he's saying is, hey, I'm not going to play, so let's keep the money and let's invest that money. You're like, let's, you know, go and make another play with that money. And and so maybe it was an easy choice for him. But but I just I agree NIL is dirty business right now. But I also agree that that quitting football because you didn't get what you wanted is a bad look. You know, and and I'm never going to be a big fan of that. That is very quitter quarterback. You know, but let ask. me ask you: You're out there having these conversations. Yeah, you're out there trying to attach money to college football players. How is how would you describe those conversations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that part of the problem on the advertising front is people don't understand nil. They don't understand. First of all, I'd say people don't understand streaming and how powerful it is. But then when you say, "Hey, like we stream and we've got 112,000 people a month in Utah that listen to this show like repeatedly over and over again, and we have numbers and analytics that back that up." And then you try to say, hey, well, we'd love to attach you to this or that player who's going to be on our show every week, you know, once the season gets here. They, they're like, oh, well, that's cool, but I don't understand how that would move the needle. And, and it's like, no, and we tried radio. It didn't work. Yeah. So they don't understand the difference between like radio and streaming. And then this aspect of NIL, like I've asked probably five or six people, major business owners, hey, do you know what NIL is? No, nah, never heard never of heard it. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. That is a, that is what the problem is like that's why and and you know we reach out to people in salt lake and provo like all over the place and then you explain it you're like well hey this guy is going to be on our show um you know he plays for the utes and you know hey we're going to do x y and z here's how our deals structure with them you know and this player is going to tweet about you this player is going to social about you he's going to come by and eat at your restaurant yeah he's going to come and get his oil changed he's going to wear your clothing yeah and they're like, well, he's 20 years old. But can we count? Like one guy specifically said to me, can we count on him? I'm like, well, you're paying him. So are, are, you're not going to pay him if he doesn't come through, right? Yeah, but that that's the conversation yes. you're having. That's the conversation you're having. I can tell you we don't have those conversations about BYU athletes. We don't. And it, it is it is striking to me that Utah is not out there curating the brand of the Utah Ute football player. I, I I don't understand it. It is it's absolutely shocking to me. And again, it needs to be said. I want to be really clear because I know we get new listeners all the time on this show. We're not from Utah. We're not BYU fans. We're not mm -hmm. Utah fans. We we don't have affiliations. We work for nobody but ourselves. We're we're telling you what we're experiencing based on the conversations we're having with people who are unaffiliated with either program. These are just business owners, like business professionals who we're just asking questions and trying to do business with.
this is the kind of reaction we're getting. So we, you know, in the vaunted pre-show meeting behind the scenes, behind we, the scenes, we had a conversation about like, hey, like this quarterback at LSU just essentially quit. He retired. And then we put our heads together and we're like, yeah, there's not a lot of understanding around NIL in the business world. No. And so then it kind of puts this picture together of like, okay, well, it's one thing to not understand it, but then have the conversation and it makes sense and you want to do it. Okay, great. But then when I start hearing, hey, okay, I understand NIL now, but I have some concerns about this guy or that guy, specifically in the in the Utah program, that's when I'm like, hey, like, what's this about? Like, there's got to be more that's done you know, as you were saying, to curate that image. And that's what I think is fascinating. Like, whether we're talking Utah Jazz, Utes, or whoever, yeah. you have to define your image in the public eye or people are just going to make assumptions. And we see that across the board. I just don't know how you – I don't know how you fix it because I think this Miles Brennan thing at LSU is bad for football players. Yeah. I think it perpetuates a belief – that they're dealing with immature people who are going to quit and who are, you know, can't handle adversity and people like Smoothie King, which is a huge brand in New Massive. Orleans and in Louisiana, where LSU is a brand like Smoothie King or Raising Canes. Those are huge brands in that neck of the woods. And this kid took millions of dollars from those people and has probably no intention of giving it back. And they're just out that money. And this is a kid who's never played a snap of football. I, I, it is, this is a Wild. dirty, dirty business right now. It is, it is a dirty, dirty business. Uh, let's see. Eric and Raleigh says, do football players still have to attend classes? Then NIL has changed, hasn't changed anything. They do. They do have to attend classes. Uh, Eric and Raleigh says, yes, if the con contract doesn't specific specify parameters, uh, but he'll, he ruined, he'll have ruined NIL for every other player. If I could read, I wouldn't ruin this show. Facts. The point is, I think <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. I think NIL, every time an NIL deal goes murky south, you know. Because the truth is, the, the truth of the matter is for a business owner, and I hope people understand this, for a business owner, they could care less what the investment actually is. Like whether it's an NIL player or it's a billboard or it's a social media campaign. At the end of the day, what do they care about? Profit and loss. Hey, I'm spending my money on some airline in Istanbul. Is that going to get me more business in Provo? Yeah. Oh, it is? Okay, well, we're going to do that then. If it's not, then we're not going to do it. So then when you have a kid who quits, that just isn't helping the cause on any level. I completely agree with that comment. Yep. Uh, let's see. Josh Leverin says, uh, Monty, forget Utah players. Time to move on to Weber and Utah Tech. Oh, I guess Utah State too if you want. Aggie tears. Come on, man. Come on. Why you got to be cold-blooded like that? Uh, Aaron Argyle says, companies will get burned and add more clauses in future contracts to protect themselves over time. These are growing pains of a new and powerful system. I don't disagree with that. But I, I also think that it hurts. It absolutely hurts college football. It hurts college football players. It hurts guys that are trying to um, you know, grow a business for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the thing that we don't think about is these are human beings that are playing college football. Yeah. These are just dads, brothers, sons that are trying to make a living. And I think that's why the Bill Bar deal at, at BYU was so significant. Dude, look at Baylor Romney, bro. Dude works at Adobe now. Do we yeah. get that? Like, that's Baylor Romney we're talking about. I know he's not you know, starting quarterback at Alabama, but dude could sling the rock, man. Dude could play football. And now he's just at Adobe, just chilling. That's where NIL should have made a difference for someone like him. Like, that's why I think when we talk about, hey, these are growing pains of a, a, a new and powerful system. Well, it is new, but how powerful can it be if the ad person you're trying to get to spend money doesn't believe in it? That's yeah. the problem. It, you're only worth what somebody's willing to spend. Yeah. But I think Eric and Raleigh makes a really good point. Businesses should offer small stipend monthly, then a large lump sum at the end. Yeah, totally agree Agreed. with that. Agreed. Absolutely, positively, Agreed. totally agree with that. Um, let's see. Yes, bots are back. Yes, <sighs> Kanai Johnson says bots are back. But I got them early this time. Oh, you got them early. I got them early great already. There we go. See, great you know, execution. Ex 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 yeah, execute. Come on through, bro. Execute, Come on through, man. bro. You know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Xavier Pena says, BYU built the number one broadcast building in the world. Now they have their own network and, 
and it did bring them back to the Utes level. I agree with that. Yeah. And I also think, by the way, it's part of the reason that more business flows through Provo than it does up on the Hill. Yeah. Because I think you have, let's be honest, you have titans of business that come out of BYU, and I'm sure you do at Utah, but... Look at who works at Domo. Look at who works at Adobe. Look at who works at Weave. Look at who works at yes, all these dude. these company Qualtrics. Like Ryan Smith is a BYU alum. You Danny look at, Ainge. You look at all these guys that are doing business in 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 Utah. Yeah, they're BYU alums, and, and I understand. I'm not saying that Utah is a bad institution. It certainly is not. BYU puts out titans of business. They put out billionaires and millionaires. And I just, I think those people are more married to the community than Utah alums are. I think Utah alums are, it, it's its what Chris Hill said a couple of weeks ago. Oh, our Utah alums are all over the Bay Area. Well, that's cool. They're not spending their money in Utah. Are we clear on that? BYU alums are all over the Wasatch Front spending their money in Utah, outworking the Utes. Thanks. And it's starting, in my opinion, it is costing Utah football players and basketball players and athletes money. Yeah, there it, it is shocking to me that you don't have a Coug Connect operating it at, at at Utah. That's it's shocking to me. Yeah, I, I, I you you just won the Pac-12. You just played in a Rose Bowl, and maybe Cam Rising has a huge NIL deal. I don't know about it. And trust me, my life is sports. How do I not know about that? Yeah. I, I don't understand that. Too can I, bad. Can I Johnson says NIL should have some type of clause making the player have to play at least one year before signing an NIL deal. But doesn't that defeat the purpose? I think it because if you have a JUCO transfer, like, I, I just do, do coaches like I, I think it has to be unlimited because coaches have freedoms that players do not. Yeah. So I think it has to be unlimited. William says, saw dudes. Right. Saw dude. Right. What's up, my man? <laughs> saw, dude. What's going on? Michael Peck says, a lot of NIL contracts are coming out with clauses for starting and playing time. I think we'll see some NIL self-correction. Totally agree. Yeah. I think. Well, it's just got to happen. Yeah. I think, I think it's coming. I think it is. I think it is. It will. It will. It's like anything else in I'm, business, I'm man. trying to be gentle. Like. You're going to have players that are going to make mistakes. They're young men, and a lot of these young men don't take advice or don't have advice being given. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see there are going to be mistakes being made. But I think you're going to see that NIL is going to change dramatically. I, I have to think regulation is going to come in and attach. or, or The transfer portal is a big part of it. Yeah. And by the way, if you think coaches are not recruiting on nil deals come on who are we kidding they're they're recruiting on that they're they're saying hey you come here i mean you just had a quarterback at lsu quit and walk away from millions of dollars without ever having played a snap i mean hey i come play with us at lsu we'll get you a, a deal with smoothie king mm -hmm. come play at lsu we'll get you a deal with raising canes mm -hmm. think about that man like those are those are big deals to a kid. Yes, that I, I mean Miles Brennan probably never had to worry about finding a meal because he had Smoothie King and, and Raising Canes. I want it. You know, like how much how much was that lifetime gift card for? You know what I mean? Like that's the, seriously that's the reality of it. Uh, Josh Lovern says, how do how would no NAL collective at Utah hurt them if they went to the Big Twelve? I don't know. I I think. The Pac-12 has been an abject failure. I mean, and, and if we're talking about Pac-12 a little bit here as well, you can't tell me that NIL hasn't been Im impacted by the lack of a TV deal. Yeah. Uh, I, you can't tell me that big t or Pac-12 schools haven't been impacted by the fact that they're not on TV. Yeah. I mean, and, and you can't, so that hurts recruiting. Lack of NIL is absolutely a competitive disadvantage. There, there's no doubt. Kalani Sataki can go out and say, hey, we have Built Bar. Who, by the way, there's a, a car in NASCAR sponsored by Built Bar. It, like, it's Built Bar, man. That's a big brand. Hey, they're one of our main, you know, sponsors for our kids. Like, nobody at BYU has to worry about tuition. They're all paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's a big talking point. Think about it, if you're a walk-on. If you're think about the lifestyle of a BYU recruit. You're probably you're probably in the church, right? Like, if you're locally, I mean, yes. 
you're in the church, like you're you're probably going to serve a mission. You're going to take two years off. Probably going to play a year, take two years off, come back. Like you're never going to have to worry about tuition. Right. You're never going to have to worry about facilities. God you're bless. You're never going to have to worry about your post football career. I mean, like what? The, look at Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, who's going to now be a tight end for New Orleans. He turned down a job on Wall Street. Yeah. What was that, five years ago now? He turned down a job on Wall Street, for crying out loud. I mean, when you look at these guys and you look at where where the advantages are for your entire, the rest of your life, because let's be honest about it, and I I think we need to, to really be clear about this. Playing college athletics, basketball, football, if you're a Red Rocks, like whoever, that should set you up for the rest of your life. That's free tuition. That's that's free job. That's like the rest of your life. Everything you can want. And I don't mean Jamal Williams yelling at his teammates about the, the effing record last year. I mean the third stringer who's going to wind up at at Domo, at Qualtrics, at, at Adobe, at Crumble, at all of these, at Weave, at Works, you know, we, we work at, in all these places, and where are their headquarters? Their headquarters are right at Thanksgiving Point. Drive yeah. up beyond, you know, Adobe. Drive up the hill a little bit. Look at all the names on the buildings. That's where these guys are making their livings at, man. So when we talk about, you know, hey, Kyle Van Oy is never going to have to worry about money again because he's got multiple Super Bowl rings. Okay, cool, right? Look at a guy like Jaron Hall in today's in today's world. Jaron Hall probably, probably, if all things break right, Jaron Hall probably gets drafted into the NFL, right? He's an NFL draft pick, Heisman Trophy, you know, watch list, all that good stuff. Jaron Hall's never going to have to worry about money. Jaron Hall never plays a snap in the NFL. I guarantee he's got a job. Yeah. Baylor Romney, Adobe, perfect example. Walks away from football, walks into a corporate job. You know, like, the opportunity that college is supposed to present to you, that's what's being lost in this NIL stuff. Yeah. When we talk about is NIL broken, that to me is what we're talking about. We're talking about a situation where I don't know that it's serving the kid right now. I, I don't know that it's serving the athlete right now. And I think when you're a big time college player, like the Zach Wilsons of the world are very different. That lifestyle situation, your parents have money, you add money, you can go play wherever you want. Like, that's a different deal. Yeah. I'm talking about the kid that doesn't have a two-parent home. Yeah. I'm talking about the kid that doesn't have a huge circle of friends, that doesn't have three brothers that play as well. Like, I'm talking about the poly football player who's trying to figure out what he's going to do because he knows that his, his options are limited if he doesn't make it in football. Yeah, And part of the reason he goes to BYU is to get an education and get in the pipeline at BYU. Like, those are the guys I'm talking about. Yeah. The the under-advantaged, the disadvantaged kids who should really be profiting from NIL. And they're not. They're not. I'm not worried about the entitled kid. I'm worried about the underprivileged kid. Yeah, and I think the trouble is, is that the underprivileged kid has to think about building their brand. They don't have the inherent built-in advantages of being you know, Jaron Hall, a Heisman Trophy winner. You know, that's yeah. the thing. Like, if you think about Jimmy, who just sits on the bench all season, you don't know him. You don't, like, you don't know. Like, the only reason we know who Jacob Conover is is because now he's actually got a chance to see the field, right? Like, yeah. that's the only reason you know who he is. How many people know that he was in the Alabama system or that he, you know, did some things over there? Does your average BYU fan or your average business owner even know that? Hell no. They don't know that. So that's why I say, like, you just have to consider these things. People don't know. Dude, sports is our life. We know this because we have to know this. Yes. The average fan doesn't know these things. The average fan doesn't pay attention to where Baylor Romney went or where Jacob Conover played, you know, his first year of football or whatever. Like, they don't know that stuff. And that's why I say, if you're Jimmy Bob sitting on the bench, you have to get on TikTok. You have to get on Instagram and build your following and be something other than a football player, for NIL to work for you. NIL yeah. is not just going to feed you because you put on the, the the threads every Saturday. You know, yeah. like that's not going to work. I agree. Huey Reed, good morning to you. Huey said, would be interesting to see players getting paid by performance, touchdowns, broken tackles, interceptions, et cetera. Yeah, I would. It'd be very interesting. Josh Lovren says, uh, look up Cam Ward, his NIL deal from SC. Oh, yeah, incarnate word, Cam Ward. Yeah, Cam Ward 
And Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cam Ward, I think Cam Ward got like a $50,000 cash payout to make appearances for a car dealership. And he got like a house or a condo or something like Cam Ward at Incarnate Word was a stud. Mm -hmm. I mean, a stud. Like had an incredible, and I I should have probably looked up his stats, but Cam Ward, he threw something like 50 touchdowns. Like he had crazy numbers. Right. And he wound up at Washington State. And he got like a truck. He got like a $50,000 appearance. Like crazy NIL stuff. Almost, I want to say it's like a six-figure NIL deal. That includes a house or a condo because the guy performed on the field. It'll be interesting to see. Kanai Johnson uh, says, with Ryan Smith and Danny Ainge being BYU alum, why not make a TV deal or stream deal with BYU Networks? I don't know. I don't know because that's not big enough. Bro, Cam Ward threw for 4,600 yards and 47 touchdowns and 10 interceptions in 2021. There you go. That is nuts. Yeah, look look up. He got like, I'm pretty sure he was given a condo or a house. He was given a like a, a a pickup truck and he got like 40 50 grand. It was a $90,000 package for Ward. His deal includes an an, an apartment in Pullman, use of a pickup truck from a booster owned go. car dealership and $50,000 in cash in exchange for promotional appearances. The NIL deal allows him not to worry about transportation or housing and gives him 50k in walking around money. Um and yeah, the total package is worth about ninety grand. It's crazy in Pullman, Washington. Yeah, how are we not getting that in Salt Lake City? Yeah. I'm just trying to understand that. Like I am trying to understand that. Yeah, you know, I just you know, it is what it is, man. Uh, let's see. Robert says Tanner Mangum ended up at Nike. Air Jordan. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, let's see. Gabe Levley says, "Can we talk about what a hotbed of entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism?" SLC is though so many of my favorite brands. Built Bar, um, yeah, he names a bunch. Crumble, Hay, Hay Grill, Hay, yeah. I, I mean, it is this the climate in the state of Utah mm-hmm. is incredible. I mean, like I look at Barbecue Pit Stop, yeah, not just because they're an advertiser of ours, but I look at Barbecue Pit Stop. That guy, Steve at Barbecue Pit Stop, is a businessman. That is a guy who understands how to make money and do business. I'm for real. It's crazy. I I look at, you know, we've talked to a ton of these companies now. And, you know, I look at all these different places. And it truly is, hey, one guy started a business that turned into this. You know, it's it's insane. Yeah. It is insane. You know, I, I just. Yeah. You That's know. how it works. Uh, talking with Raphael Podcast. On PBS Radio. Says, good morning, a bit late to the show. How dare you? Come on, man. Be better. How dare you? Be better. So you better check yourself. Micah Hanneman from uh, BYU alum Micah Hanneman in 20 minutes. Uh, right here on the Monte Show, we'll ask him about NAL. Let's talk a little uh, Utah BYU AP Top 25. Mm-hmm. So Utah's ranked 7th in the preseason AP poll. Right. You like that number too much, too little? Where you? Uh, I mean, I think it's I think it's res- respectable. I mean, I think that probably five would have been a better better number, you know. But I mean, that's just kind of nitpicking. I think that <clears throat> I think that BYU is more the conversation. Them being a twenty five, I thought was a little disrespectful. I think they're a top twenty team for sure. Um, not not deep into the top twenty. I wouldn't say they're any any. They're not close to ten. But I would say you know twenty nineteen eighteen anywhere in there would have been totally suitable for BYU. Uh, and I think that for Utah, you know, you have this dynamic where Cam Rising is getting a lot of respect nationally. People think that he can really play, and he can. There's no doubt about it. But it's just a question of how far can he take them. So yeah. coming in at number seven, I think was totally fine. Uh, I would have preferred to see them at four or five, if I'm being honest. But I think seven's respectable. Now you can play your way up to, you know, four, third, second. You know, like you can play your way up to that, and it starts, uh, you know, going down to Florida and winning that football game, which I think they're completely capable of. Uh, BYU, on the other hand, I think, as usual, it's a different conversation. I think BYU has to beat the living piss out of people to <laughs> to get respect. I, I just think they do. I think this nonsense last year about Idaho State and how you handled all that, that cost you some credibility, you know? That that's costs you credibility. So that's why I say, you know, when, again, when we do that watch party, September 17th at Barbecue Pit Stop in Lehigh to watch them play Oregon, 
you can't lose by 25 to Oregon, bro. You got to beat them by, you know, a possession or maybe even 10 points. I'd love to see that out of BYU. Yeah, Adler Harris gives us a $20 tip. Adler, I appreciate you very much. He says, uh, keep up the good work. Um, he said, I don't always agree with you guys, but the show is captivating. You guys know your stuff. Good work. Enjoy the tip. Thanks, Adler. Appreciate Thanks, man. You. Appreciate you. Tyler Top says, you guys are so much better than any other morning show in Utah. You've, you've all ruined DJ and PK for me, which is okay. Oh, appreciate that, man. Sorry, man. Uh, Boyd Lake said, had we not lost to UAB, BYU would be a, a deserve a better preseason ranking. Well, well, but what am I going to say? Candies and nuts. You did lose. You, you did. did. You did. And that's, and you so did. that's the thing. While I agree with you, I do think they're better than 25. As I was just saying, I think they're probably top 20. That's what I think their true ranking is. If we're just looking at football, but you can't lose to UAB. You can't have yeah. the Baylor game. Yeah. You, like you can't do these things because you don't have the built-in advantage that a team like Utah has for all the things the Pac-12 is not, right? Terrible conference, no distribution, I totally with it. You're in a conference. You're in a P5 conference as it stands right now. That's a built-in advantage. So that's why I say I don't want to hear that you didn't beat, you know, East Carolina by 40. I don't want to see a 10-point win against that team. I want domination that's what has to happen yeah and i i think when you look at the ap top 25 i mean obviously being seven behind alabama one ohio state two georgia three um clemson four i think one of the most overrated teams in the country is notre dame and they're going to get i think shellacked at the shoe uh, against ohio state coming up to open the season texas a&m six and who i also think is overrated and and then you have utah at seven um, so I, I don't necessarily believe that's a bad thing. I that's what I mean. At, They're top five though. Yeah. What I mean? look at the, I look at the Utes and I think the question is what happens if Cam Rising gets hurt? I think you're in, you're in real trouble. Yeah. If Cam goes down, I don't know that you know who your number two quarterback is. Um, I think that's a big one. I think that kind of board. you're going to be the, my biggest concern for Utah my biggest concern is that you're going to be a run the ball all the time team. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to let. You have to let these wide receivers develop. And and I think if you are Devon Vele or, you know, whoever you want to point to, the, the you know, Solomon Ennis, uh, you know, Jalen Dixon comes to mind, like, you're going to have to find a, you're going to have to find a go-to. Yeah. And it's probably Vele. I mean, obviously that's a guy that's been in the system a little bit, but I think number seven's a little low. I mean, with this defense, um, and I think when, when you have the talent up front, that this team has, whether it's Tafuna, whether it's, you know, Van Filiger, like you're going to get after the quarterback. Yeah. I'm a little surprised. And again, this is just me. I'm a little surprised that, that Utah's at seven. I don't think that's a bad place to be. I mean, if you're in seven, you, there's no reason you can't be top five by the end of the season. You know, guys are going to lose, but right? you're better than A&M and Notre Dame. Come on. Like, I think they're better than A&M and Notre Dame. I I'm, I'm interested to see what Texas A&M is. I, I truly am interested because I think there's a lot of questions around Texas A&M. I think it is, I think it's going to be very interesting. And I think for BYU being 25, I feel like BYU at 25 is a little low. I I, I think, I think yeah. you're better than Houston. I don't know. Is Cincinnati, what Cincinnati, can Cincinnati do what they did last year? It's not pr probable. It's not even likely. Yeah. I mean, Cincinnati's at 23, Wake Forest, Old Miss, are you are you are you better than Old Miss? Mm. It's an interesting question. I mean, it'll be. But it'll see, be... that's the thing with BYU. That right there, that question. If we have to ask if you're better than that team, then you're probably not getting the the the. But come on, isn't Old Miss twenty one because they're in the SEC? Uh, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, that, but that's so, what I mean about he, conference affiliation. He's got so much talent going into that program. Yeah, that's un Jackson Dart. Like you, you have to prove that you are who you are. And I understand that Jax is going to win that job. I totally get that. But you've got to prove that you're something that that program's never been. Like, I, I, I look at I look at Wisco. I look at Wisconsin. Wisconsin doesn't have anything that excites me that you'd be 18th. Yeah. BYU should be a better team today than Wisconsin is. But that's why I maintain, if you're BYU, you have to prove a point every single week. And I don't... Well, and it's not necessarily about winning or losing. It depends on the opponent. So like Baylor this year, you need to beat Baylor this year. Oregon, you need to beat Oregon this year. Like when I look up and down the schedule, like the big boys, you've got to beat them, whether that's by one point or 50 points. Those have to be wins. And then the rest of the way, 
You got to shellac these teams that are, are are just not on your level because when we look at the schedule and we see Wisconsin at, at freaking 18 and you're at 25, well, how does beating the hell out of these other teams on your schedule help you? Yeah. That's my point. Yeah, we'll see exactly what what happens here. But I, I mean, I still maintain, I still maintain both of these teams have plenty of quality wins on their schedules to to prove these rankings wrong. Yeah, I think obviously the the ride's a lot shorter for Utah to the top of the table. I mean, you have, but but then again, I also think you've got a you've got a lot of proving to do. I don't know what what I don't know ultimately what Utah's offensive line looks like. I mean, I would I would think that you know at the end of the day, you know, Braden Daniels and company should be fine. You should be fine. But they need to stay healthy. How big of a role does Gabe Reed play on this defense? I think that's a huge question. Mahmoud Dabate, how, you know, they open against Florida. Tell me he's not going to be motivated. That cat can run. Yes. I mean, like, they're going to be fast. I think that, again, if you if you look up, if you look up top and, and you look at you look at what they have, that they're they're gonna be good on the lines. They're going to be good on the lines at Utah. Well, it's a Kyle Whittingham team, so you know they're going to be good on the lines. The defense is going to be good, and you're going to yeah. be able to run the football. That's what we know, traditionally speaking, about Kyle Whittingham teams. But the question is, and this is the point you started with, are they going to pass the football? Are Is there going to be an over-the-top threat? And that's the question that I think remains in this wide receiver core. Who's going to be that guy that can take the top off the defense and and allow you to run the ball more effectively. Because I got news for Kyle Whittingham, right? I guess I'm giving advice to everybody today. You're not, <laughs> dude, if you're running against nine guys in the box, you're not running the football. That's not happening, right? You're not, you're just not. You have to have that threat of throwing the football to be able to run it effectively. Yeah. So that's why I say it's not, you're not going to be in the Rose Bowl. You're not going to be winning the conference if you can't pass the football, man. Yeah. And that's what I'm really concerned about. Your point about Cam getting hurt, he can't get hurt. That can't it's not happen. not an option. That's just not going to work, man. It's not an option. Micah Hanneman in 10 minutes talking BYU football as we look at the AP preseason top 25 here on the Monty Show presented by Barbecue Pit Stop. Five area locations right here in the state of Utah. Get in there, fill it out. We're giving away a trip or two to see BYU uh, take on Notre Dame in the Shamrock Series in Las Vegas. It is going to be, it's going to be a blast. We are sending you to Las Vegas, two nights at the Palms Casino Resort, two tickets to the game, a two hundred fifty dollars gas card to get you there. It is going to be a blast. The only way to enter to win is to go to Barbecue Pit Stop in Logan, Lehigh, Layton. Murray and St. George, there is an enter to win box on the counter of every single one of those stores. All you do, fill out the slip, drop it in there, tell them, hey, found, about, found out about you guys on the Monty Show, and then join us at the Barbecue Pit Stop in Lehigh on the 17th of September as BYU travels to Eugene to take on Oregon. They're duck hunting. Yeah. We'll watch the game. We're going to have a bunch of chicken wings on a smoker there for you. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, as we have a BYU-Oregon watch party, and then at halftime of that game, we are going to draw the winner to see BYU and Notre Dame in Las Vegas just less than three weeks from that date. Three weeks later, you're going to be in Las Vegas watching BYU and Notre Dame in the Shamrock Series. And I think at that time of the year, that's when football's great. We're in it. I am. Yeah, I'm super stoked to see what that is. 25 for BYU. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I don't like it. I think it's too low. I think that 25 for BYU is a little disrespectful when you know, you've got Wisconsin at 18. You've got some of these other teams that that are unproven, you know. I again, you brought up Ole Miss. Like Ole Miss is in the SEC and I absolutely agree with you. I I completely agree that they're getting the nod because they're in the SEC, as they should. Yeah. The SEC has earned that right. But if we're just looking at it on, you know, Xs and Os on the football field, I think BYU could hang with an Ole Miss. I really do. I don't know that they win the game, but I do think you're not getting blown out by that team. I definitely think you could beat Wisconsin. They're going to be huge up front. Yeah, but, but so you is could BYU. Beat them. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. If you look at you know Freeland or you know Connor Pay, Clark Barrington, Harris yeah. Lachance, like you know, obviously all those guys have to stay healthy. But I mean, I think you have seven or eight guys. Um, you know, that you can that you can say are capable of starting at BYU on the offensive line. You have depth there this year. Yeah. I, and I know I say it every day when we talk about BYU on this show, but I think you also have a situation where you have one of the best wide receiver rooms in, in that you've had recently. I mean, obviously with Gunnar Romney, you know, Puka Nakua, you know, I, I think you have two really 
good number one guys. But Cody Epps is not a joke. Cody Epps is legit. Yeah. I'm telling you, that kid can fly and he can catch the football. But what does it come down to? As it always does with BYU. Yep. Jaron Hall in the season he has. Let's go back to the Zach Wilson well, season, right? Everybody was like, hey, Zach Wilson's the best ever. He's going to get drafted high. You know, any team, anywhere, anytime, right? Wearing the headband. Can Jaron <laughs> Hall have that have that same vibe? Can Jaron Hall come yeah. out and do something similar to what Zach Wilson did? Because if he does that, and then you pair him with that wide receiver room, you pair him with that offensive line, I'm telling you, man. And I, again, I'm not from Utah. I'm not a BYU fan. But I think this team can can do some damage. This team can beat some teams that nobody expects them to beat. And that's the essence of BYU football seemingly every single year. Can you beat Baylor? Can you beat Oregon? Uh, you know, Can you beat any of these other tough opponents on the schedule? I don't know. Are you going to beat Notre Dame in Las Vegas? I think you are. But that remains to be seen. Is Jaron Hall healthy for that game? Is the offensive line in good shape? Right? Can you run the football in BYU country? I don't know. We need to see those things. But what I can tell you is that I think BYU schedule uh, gives them a little bit of breathing room to start the year. Whereas for Utah, you're going down to Gainesville to play Florida. You better get it going quick because that 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 number seven overall ranking is going to be like 15, 16 if you lose that and you lose it in an embarrassing fashion. Like if you go to Florida and you lose by like 10 or 14 points and you look bad doing it, you're going to fall quickly. But if you win that game and you show people, hey, we're the same team as we were last year, except the difference is Cam Rising has that year of experience now and is ready to go, well, now you're going to be contending in the top five pretty much the whole season. So I just think there's a lot on the line these first couple of weeks. Yeah, I I, I would agree. And I, I think you're going to you're gonna get exposed for what you are and who you are very quickly if you're BYU. And again, I, I think that you are going to have to understand how good these linebackers are. Do these mm -hmm. linebackers meet up to the expectation? Do you have a secondary that can cover? I mean, Malik Moore is going to have to be really good this year. For them to have success on defense, I think he's one of those guys. And, and I mean, obviously, Chaz Ayu, you know, Keenan Peely, like I, everybody in that front seven is going to have to produce. For, for BYU to be really good, they're going to have to produce. Yeah. They're going to have to stay healthy. The lines are going to have to stay healthy. But there is no reason to believe that this defense cannot compete with anybody that they're going to see this year. And I think it's very difficult when you look at BYU, the knock on BYU has historically been that they can't compete athletically. Yeah. And that, that you know they can't run with the competition. Well, offensively, I don't think you can say that anymore. I think defensively, there are questions all over the place about, hey, how athletic can this secondary be? How, you know, I mean, I don't think, I think Malik Moore and Chaz Ayu are great players, but are, are you in that secondary constantly going to be in nickel and dime to make up for, for what you don't have? Mm -hmm. Because if you are, you're not going to win a whole lot of games. This, this defense needs, there's going to come a time where you're going to have to play man coverage and you're going to have to win those battles. You versus you, me. I mean, it, you're with, with this schedule and going into the Big 12 next year, that's why I say, do not overlook this season for BYU. You, you simply cannot overlook this season. It is so important, in my opinion. Yeah. It is so important that this team be ready to rock and roll. For this season, and yeah. I know it's really easy. You're going into the Big 12, and and I understand that there's a lot of anticipation leading up to that, and I understand that there are expectations. I totally get that. This season right here, right now, when you're coming out of the box with the, the, the schedule that BYU is, you've got to focus on this season right here, right now. Yeah. You cannot afford to get caught looking ahead to a year from now because, again, a, and I don't think Kalani and company are in any way, shape, or form looking past this season. But you've got kids on this roster right now who are never going to play in the Big 12. Yeah. They're never going to be part of a Big 12 football team. So you've got to win now. Yeah. Now. And you have everything to play for. You have a two-loss season. You're going to a big bowl game. If you look across the, the, the perennial powerhouses of college football, everybody has a schedule that's got multiple losses in it. Mm -hmm. Multiple losses. Mm -hmm. Robert says, BYU's O-line needs to stay healthy. Too many injuries last year. Well, Harris Lachance is no better example than that. I think he is a huge, huge, huge key. Yeah. Not just as a human being, but he is a huge key to the success or failure mm -hmm. um, of whether or not 
this offensive line succeeds. If if Harris stays healthy, because I mean, you you have, there's no doubt in my mind, and this is just my thing. I think on this BYU offensive line, when when you look up and down, and I I there's not a guy that's weak. Connor Pay, Clark Barrington, Harris Lachance, you know, Joe Tukuafu. I mean, you have guys who can stand at the point of attack and deliver. Yeah. My question again is going to be health. Jaron Hall's health is Jaron Hall. And take take no further look than what happened to Zach Wilson over the weekend. Yep. Zach Wilson had no business running that football that wound up with this knee injury. And I understand you're trying to make a point and just out there playing free flow in football. Jaron Hall's got to step out of bounds. We can't have Arizona State Sun Devils falling on him at the goal line. Yeah. Because this time it's Notre Dame fighting Irish guys that are big human beings. You can't have him on the bottom of a pile. Jaron Hall's got to be a smarter football player this year, and my guess is he will. Yeah. Because from all indications, Jaron Hall is in fantastic shape. All right. Without further ado, um, let's get uh, BYU alum Micah Hanneman on the show. Micah, how the heck are you, man? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to see you, man. Um, you know, yeah. it's interesting as we as we sit here and get ready for the season, as a guy who played for so much of your life, yeah. what is this time of year like for you right now? Oh, it's different. It's a lot different. This is usually the time of the year my life was starting, you know. Yeah, I bet. I, I bet. Fall camp and everything. Yeah. Yeah, and but I think that's one of the interesting besides, things when you look at fall camp in this time of year. Isn't there like a fire that burns for you? Isn't there like a – I mean, I would think – and I, obviously, I never played fall camp. I never played football. I'm a baseball player. But as a football guy, I would imagine there's got to be a certain burn. There's got to be a certain feeling that you have when this time of year comes up. Like, you want to put pads and a helmet on. Oh, yeah, for sure. i got to hold myself back now in the in the public life. <laughs> <laughs> find different ways to relieve some of yeah, that. Yeah, I bet. But let's yeah, let's talk a little bit about your time at BYU because I think one of the things that's so interesting is – you were at a time at BYU where everything changed. So you play your one year, you go serve a mission, you come back. What do you? Wh- how different was the program when you came back? Because you were coming into this window where Bronco was going out, Kalani's coming in. So you come back from serving. How different was BYU football at that point? Yeah, so when I came back, that was Bronco's last year, 2015. And, yeah, that was a, that was a surprise that last – right before our bowl game when he announced that he was leaving. You know, and everyone's wondering, you know, who's going to be the next coach, all that. And then there was a huge, huge swing from the difference between the Bronco coaching staff and the Kalani coaching staff. And, you know, pros and cons, it's, it's hard when you have been in in the same system for a couple of years to make that switch. But I knew in the long run that it was going to be it was going to be fine. That was going to be a good thing for BYU football. But, yeah, it was a big difference. Did you miss, as we talk with uh, BYU alum Micah Hanneman on the Monty Show, did you miss Bronco? What was that void like? Because I think we all knew that time was coming. I, I, I think it was no secret that he had looked a little bit, he had flirted a little bit. But then when it actually happens and he's not there, I mean, was yeah. there a realization? Was there a moment where you're like, man, this is a different BYU football program now? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, he was there for a long time. You know, he had all sorts of systems in place, everything. He was very military style coaching, you know, so you kind of knew exactly what you were going to get every time that you showed up that day with Bronco and then not having any coach for a little bit and then going to Sataki where it's a lot more laid back. But obviously now he has certain systems in place that, that are working well. But yeah, Bronco. I I really loved playing playing for Bronco. He he did a great job of getting the most out of out of his players. You know, guys that shouldn't have been as good. He made them who they were. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. One of the things I and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. Not to live in the past, but I felt like Bronco got a bad rap. I don't know unless you played for him, as obviously you did. But unless you played for him, and unless he impacted your life on the level that he impacted your life. I don't think we as as media members, I don't think we as as football fans truly understood or maybe the right word Micah is appreciated the impact yeah. that Bronco Mendenhall had on people. Was he undervalued as the coach at BYU? I feel like from an outsider's perspective, he he was very undervalued. He 
he he was a defensive mastermind in my opinion like he would call plays right into place he he was a very very respectable coach all the players he had all of their respect they might not have liked him but they definitely respected him and he respected his players as well so it was yeah it was cool like, i remember one story of ziggy also he tried to quit probably three four times while he was there under bronco and bronco would go to his apartment, you know, show up after he just left practice. And he definitely is like a perfect example of just the type of person that Bronco was. He would not let him quit and he got the most out of him. Ended up working out pretty good for him too. So, but yeah. Yeah, did that work out okay for Ziggy? I think it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good decision by him not to quit. Yeah. And then, so it was a different flow when, when Kalani showed up. When you look at how he has been – you know, guiding BYU football. I mean, do you do you see do you see progress? I mean, when when as an alumni, as a guy who wore the the Y on your hat for all those years, like when you look at BYU football now, has Kalani done a good job as a steward of the program? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Kalani, I feel like Kalani has all of the aspects that make a good head coach. You know, he might, yeah, he has the recruiting side. He's very personable. I feel like all around, he's he's one of the best head coaches that, that BYU football can have for sure. But yeah. yeah and I, I he, think that's a very difficult job to take. I mean, if you think about it, and again, you were there, and that's why I'm asking you this. I think it's very rare that you have the perspective that you have. But when you look at what Kalani Sataki was asked to do, and you look at taking that job, that's not yeah. an easy job to A, find a candidate no. for, and then have a guy that's come in. And I actually give him a lot of credit. I, I, well, I, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's been seamless. I think he's done a really good job building forward. I mean, that's not an easy job to do is to be the head coach at BYU, right? Oh, no way. You have, yeah, everybody, everybody thinks that they're a part of the head coach job. All, so many people that, yeah, he has to deal with. And there's so many different aspects to being a head coach at BYU. People going on missions, people coming back from missions um on a roll stuff like there's so so many different things that other college head coaches don't have to deal with so yeah, yeah I, I have tremendous amount of respect for whoever takes on that job and I, I i love kalani as well you know and him and bronco they're so much different but the love and respect is all it's all the same michael let me ask you this about serving a mission and the the toll that takes because we hear so much about uh, you know, that, hey, they they have a bunch of 30-year-old dads playing football at BYU. <laughs> like, what does that do to you when you – because you played a year, and correct me if I'm wrong, you played a year, then you served two years, I think, in the Carlsbad mission. Like, what is serving – what is that time away from football? A, how does it impact you physically, and how does it change you as a football player? I mean, you kind of, it kind of is a growing up period for sure. So I came back a lot more mature, a lot more focused on – what I wanted to get done, you know, what I wanted to do. Physically, I was lucky that I was in Carlsbad, so I was eating I was eating good, you know, in Southern California. There's plenty of – I was eating good over there, plus I was able to exercise every single day. So I came back. I didn't – I definitely lost a step because you're not out there hitting people or sprinting every single day. And that's, that's where you see a lot of, like, the joint injury and stuff. But I just – I made it a commit. I ran every single day of my mission just – went on long distance runs just to make sure that my knees were going to be fine when I got home and worked out good. And, but yeah, just the maturity part was the biggest difference. I felt like I came back just a better person all around, which in turn made me a better football player. You know? Wow. That's huge. And I, I, I think one of the things that, that we often forget is that there is a, at, at BYU specifically, I mean, nine out of 10 guys in any college program are not going to play in the NFL. They're never going to get a paycheck uh, to strap on a chin strap, right? So, I mean, you go and you serve and you come back. I mean, is, is, your, is your focus on getting ready for the next level? Because, I mean, you wound up signing a free agent contract with the Browns. Yeah. Um, you know, is your, it, where is your focus? Does it change on what you're hoping to accomplish as a football player? So, for me personally – my focus was that's that was my goal was to just be focused 100 percent on football a lot of guys though you see will come home and their focus is they want to get married start having kids and then that obviously will lose focus on football because it's really hard like you said the the amount of people that make it to nfl it has to be everything you know it has to be 
every single thing that you think about, everything that you do every day has to be all focused on football and then throw school in there too. It's kind of hard to balance other things than football and school if that's what you're trying to do. But that was, that was my goal and I'm happy with, with what happened. And, but yeah, yeah, I bet you are. We're talking to Micah Hanneman. I mean, so let's talk about NIL a little bit because I, Listen, man, I'm a big believer that kids should have every opportunity. I mean, I, I feel like my perspective has always been that, you know, the institution, the NCAA, the school, I mean, they, they make obviously far more money than the player makes. I'm um, even still today. I think that's the case. But do you feel like NIL, name image likeness, NIL in college, has it, has it worked? Do you feel like it supports the player? I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing. Cause yeah, it just, it just makes sense, right? Like if, if somebody's making money off of you, you should be getting some of that money yeah. yourself, you know, especially with the, like the, the platform that college football has, it's a lot different than when they first came out with those, with the NCAA rules with no NIL. Nowadays, it's like college is pretty much like you're playing in the NFL, you know, for a lot of these big schools. So, yeah, I always thought it was funny, like, wow, they have this guy going and doing photo shoots. They have him up on the billboard for Nike but he's not seeing any of that money and they're making a bunch of money off him. So I think, I think it just makes sense. And I think it's, it's going to be, I think it's a good thing for sure. But Micah, they the get players. free socks, man. Right. Like, I mean, the <laughs> socks are all we're interested in. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, but you know, the funny thing is you're a local kid. You're, you know, you grew up obviously here in Utah um, in high school and whatnot. But the funny thing is here for me anyway, the dichotomy, the difference between the, what I call the pipeline at BYU that, that puts a guy like a, a Baylor Romney at Adobe or puts all these, you know, these BYU alums into business and the yeah. NIL deals are plentiful. Like they're, you know, Coog Connect is a, is a group that I work with. Um, we're going to have a BYU player on, but I can't even get a phone call with a guy at Utah. Like it is, it is crazy to me how different Utah and BYU is from a kid that grew up here and played football here. What are, what were the differences for you when you were looking at those two programs? honestly in high school so I was I I committed right when BYU offered me I always I didn't really I did grow up a BYU fan my dad is a big BYU fan but obviously I was taking both of them and at the time BYU was always beating Utah you know this was back in 2010 when they were on that long street yeah. and as well as I just like Nike more than Under Armour so but <laughs> oh, BYU wow. going going to BYU for sure, like all of those connections, there's a huge advantage to let you go on in life, meeting people that, that are in business. BYU does a super good job with that. So, Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Now that you're outside of it, right, and now that, that you've, you've, you've become an, a, an adult who actually has responsibilities, right, outside of yeah. football and school and homework and whatnot, has that BYU pipeline helped you? Like what is that? Give me an inside feel on that. Give me an inside perspective on that. How does the pipeline help you when you when you played football at BYU? How does that help you outside of football? Just honestly, even just what I, I see, even when I just – people just know that I played football at BYU, it makes them open up more. It's gotten me in the door, you know, my foot in the door. Obviously, it's not going to be everything, but – that connection and BYU, they're always doing socials with different companies. Like they'll have the, the different companies come. We'll have a luncheon. All the players are invited to that luncheon. You don't have to go to it, but if you want to go to it, there's plenty of players that make all these connections at, at these type of things that BYU offers. And there's, yeah, the, the alumni at BYU, they're, they're solid. They're strong, strong alumni. They're BYU till they die, you know? So, yeah. They, and they, I feel like that they understand the type of person that comes from playing college football, you know, the type of discipline, the hard work, all those other attributes that can translate pretty easily over to whatever job that, that they're looking for to hire. Talking BYU football with Micah Hanneman on the Monty Show. Let's get into this, uh, this year's club because I think one of the interesting things is this – I don't know what this grace period where BYU is entering the Big 12 next year. How difficult do you think it is to focus on this season right here and now when you when you have – obviously the Big 12 is in your future, man, but you know how this is. There's a big group of kids on this roster who are never going to play in a Big 12 game. How difficult yeah. is it, do you think, to focus on what's right in front of you? 
as a player, not I don't think it's difficult at all for for a player just to focus on their first game. You know, game game by game, the coaches always do a good job. But that is exciting. Um, they have a tough schedule. They have a Big Twelve type schedule this year, which is exciting to see. Um, that Big Twelve stuff, though, that's that's going to be that's going to be awesome. I hope I'm looking forward to it. It's hard for me to focus on this season. But I know as a player, I have a little brother on the team. They, I bet they don't even talk about that in the locker room. Maybe it comes up every now and then, but they're they're focused on the week by week, game by game, for sure. Yeah, you better be because you got to be Baylor. You got to get revenge on yeah. Baylor, right? Like, yeah. But one of the things I find so interesting is I think one of the stories that we've really got to focus on this year is how good is this secondary going to be? You're a guy that played safety at BYU. You're white, so you're slow, so you can't <laughs> compete. Like. How much of that did you hear? Like, how much about the lack of athleticism uh, and the ability to be a track star? How much of that did you hear playing at BYU? A good amount. Yeah, for sure, a good amount. I think I, I was, at some point somebody told me I was the only white corner in the NCAA, which is <laughs> pretty yeah. funny. But, but yeah, for sure, you, you definitely hear that. Um, yeah, I don't really know if that matters, but – seems to be the thing that, that everybody likes to talk about BYU. They got a bunch of white white DBs that, that yeah. can't run. But Well, yeah. and I, I think that stigma is one that is when you talk about recruiting and you talk about, you know, obviously here in Utah, it, you know, I, I think it's it's BYU is unquestioned, but you go out and you gotta win battles in Texas, California, Florida, the Southeast. You got to get linemen out of the Northeast. Like when you're recruiting nationally, I think those stigmas matter. So that's why I say, like, I feel like a key to this team this year, and I don't know your thoughts on it, but I think a key to this defense this year is are they going to be forced to play nickel and dime a lot? Do you actually, in your opinion, now, Michael, do you think BYU has a back end of this defense that, that can compete? You know, I guess we'll find out. But in my opinion, I feel like, yeah, they they definitely can compete. I hope that they're able to play man because if you can't play man, then that makes that makes defense really hard. And if you if you have dudes that can man up against dudes, that makes things easier for everybody. You know, we 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 were lucky. We had we had a couple of white white dudes, and we had a lot of scrutiny before our season when I was there. But we were able to play man ninety percent of the time, which I feel like helped out our defense. But oh, it, I think you have they, to, especially. Yeah. When you have the potential, and I know that's a, a dirty word, right? Potential. But when you have the potential that BYU has in this linebacker core, when you have, especially when you look on the offensive side of the football, I mean, you have, I think you probably have seven, eight guys legitimately that can compete for a starting spot on this offensive line. You have a really good quarterback. I think, you know, obviously Christopher Brooks is coming in with a lot of anticipation that's why I say, man, I think if if you can really keep your health high, if you could keep guys on the field, there's no reason that this defense shouldn't compete, right? Like when you look at this schedule, there's no reason you can't step out on the field against South Florida, against Baylor. I mean, everybody talks about Notre Dame. There's no reason with the talent that this team has, Micah, I believe they should be able to step out on the field and, and win games just about against anybody. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And definitely that – that middle part the the base of their defense the linebackers the the line is always going to be BYU staple and then it's always a question mark about the DBs right but I feel like the DBs are solid I've seen I've seen them putting in their work and the recruiting on that end as well has been been getting a lot better with with Sataki in there they yeah they they have they have a lot more depth than I feel like that they've ever had at DB it might not be people that everybody is talking about but they definitely have a lot more depth which you're right that's always been a problem when there's when there gets injuries on the defense that drop off from the starter to the second string is usually a pretty pretty big drop off but I feel like that's one of the biggest things that's changed since I've been there yeah it's just that hey depth. Raphael on our show wants to know uh one of our listeners wants to know what are your expectations for BYU this year oh the same better better than last year there can't be any expectations less than that so I'm expecting them to finish, you know, top 10, get invited to a bowl game. It's been a while since they've been invited to a bowl game. So I'm hoping to see that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And hey, by the way, before I let you go, how, how what did you think of Jamal Williams' speech to his his Detroit Lions teammates? I mean, obviously, that is a viral bite floating around where he yeah. talked about the record and losing games. And yeah. I thought that was one of the the best moments. And I know this probably sounds grandiose or whatever, but that might be one of the best moments in the history of hard knocks. That was a, I, I was yeah. inspired by that. I wanted to get up and go for a run. Like what did, yeah. what did you think of that speech he gave there? Oh man. I love, I loved playing with Jamal, his passion and everything. Yeah. That definitely fired me up. Gave me butterflies. Some fire, man. He's yeah. That that's pretty cool for him. But isn't that who know? he is though? That's, just that's not like is. an act He's, for him. No, that's 100%. He doesn't, he does not, yeah, he doesn't act. That's who Jamal is. Yep. Super passionate about about everything that he does. So Yeah. Hey, dude before be I around. let you go, what are you doing now? Like tell me about your life. What are you what are you working on? Shoot, man. Um right now I've been working for this company, startup company called Ride Off SLC. I've been managing. They have about sixty five cars up in Salt Lake that that we manage out rental. But yeah, I just had my first baby, baby boy a couple of months ago. So that's been, that's been an experience for sure. But yeah. And now you're old. You had a birthday yesterday, right? Yeah. Birthday yesterday. That a boy still living well. It looks like you look great, by the way. Good to see you. (laughs) And I just want to say, Hey, thanks. I know this is the first time we've met. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Yeah. You bet, man. Talk to you soon. All right. There you go. Micah Hanneman, uh, BYU alum. Good dude. Good dude. Good conversation. Really, really enjoyed that. I mean, what do you take away from what do you uh, what do you take away from that conversation, Jake? Yeah, I mean, clearly, um, you know, a lot of passion, as you would expect, right? I, I think that that the the Kalani versus Bronco conversation is really interesting. You know, those those days for BYU were very different than what what BYU is doing now, and and I have to say, I do agree with Micah that. Bronco was underappreciated. I think Bronco, you know, uh, maybe misunderstood is a is better verbiage to describe Bronco in that program at that time. But I I just think that that back in that day, you know, five eight years ago, like BYU was just in such a different place. And I think it's amazing to see what they've been able to do, mainly because Bronco laid that path. You know, Bronco laid that foundation. And I think you know when you have guys like like Micah who who were there at that time. They understand what what Bronco did and and how all that went down versus where the program's been able to go. So I just I, I think it's really cool when you get perspective of someone who was there at that time but now sees what the program is and can kind of you know bridge that gap from that side of the of the of the conversation. So yeah, I thought that that was great. Riley O'Brien with a five dollar tip says shout out to Micah with love from Riley, Bobby, and Rob Terry. Great interview, Monty. Appreciate you, Riley. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it was fun talking to him. And I, I think your point about Bronco right there is hugely important. I know that Bronco is one of the most controversial figures in BYU recent history. Mm-hmm. And I do think he was underappreciated. That's why I asked that question. I think I I I think we all knew in the last three to yeah, really the last three years, Bronco was at BYU. He had opportunities to leave, and he almost took them. Mm-hmm. And so it was not a shock when he left. It was not. And I think the the uncertainty that was created by that gap that Micah talked about, like, hey, we don't have a coach right now. Yeah. We don't have a coach right now. What are we doing? And then you bring in a guy like Kalani Sataki, who could not be more different than Bronco Mendenhall, the flip that you went from a hard charging, like really structured dude in Bronco Mendenhall to a more laid back, a more personal, a more one on one guy in Kalani Sataki. And the staff that Kalani surrounded himself with, I think you saw immediate benefits of that. I think you saw immediate wins talent wise. Now, obviously, the schedule was still very difficult. You lost a ton of games. But now I think you're seeing the fruits of all of that labor. So I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing that Bronco left, but without question. Yeah. There was a huge hole the day that Bronco Mendenhall left. Yeah. And I don't know that we still appreciate the work and the the growth that took place under Bronco Mendenhall's stewardship. And I think independence, Bronco's a huge part of the success of the independence of this program. You know, obviously the interview with the Austin American Statesman, the, the courting of the Big 12, the rejection from the Big 12, like... All of those things and all of that emotion that went into, you know, hey, how did you, you know, how did you feel about, you know, Bronco leaving? 
I think a lot of that emotion was injected into the way that the Big 12 was handled. But I yes. also don't think there's any doubt. And I know it's probably not popular in BYU country. Bronco Mendenhall is one of the most influential figures in the history of BYU football. Yeah. And I think the work that he did, the effort that he made to grow the BYU brand was tremendous and it'll never be appreciated. Now, on the flip side of that, the growth and the explosion of BYU football that we've seen under Kalani Sataki is, is nothing short of sensational. Yes. This is a huge year for BYU football. I can only say that so many times. This year could likely define success or failure in the Big 12. Totally. I, I think you've got to have a huge recruiting year. You've got to be on the recruiting trail consistently. You've got to be winning at recruiting consistently. This is an incredibly important time. You have won. You have done. You have accomplished nothing. Nothing. Because as far as the Big 12 is concerned, whatever you did before kickoff of next season is irrelevant. Fast. 1984 doesn't mean a damn thing to anybody in Stillwater. Correct. It means nothing to anybody in Manhattan, Kansas. It means nothing to anybody in Lawrence. Like, nothing to Cincinnati, to Houston. It means nothing. And that's a tough pill to swallow. You wanted so badly to be in the Big 12. Well, guess what? Now you're in the Big 12. Now what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. That, to me, that's one of the most important discussions that, that we will have this entire season. You've got to watch the recruits who are on the sideline. How many of those kids are you going to win because you've got the XII on your chest? Right? How many of those kids are going to BYU instead of going somewhere else because you're going to play in the Big 12. And furthermore, if we're if we're truth telling, how many of those kids are going to pick BYU instead of Utah, especially locally? How many of those kids are going to pick BYU over Utah because of the instability of the Pac-12 versus the the perceived stability of the Big 12? Yeah. Yeah. Perception is reality. Big 12 yep. is probably no better off than the Pac-12, let's be honest. How many of those kids are going to take the Big 12 over the Pac-12? I think a significant number. I think a significant number. Uh, Robert says, Bronco uh, brought BYU out of the, the cotton years. I don't know what you mean by that. Totally agree with you about BYU football, uh, Kane Nuren says. Ro Croton years. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, some there's... <laughs> I don't have to detail the, the end yeah. of the Croton era. Yeah. In those uniforms. Good Lord. The bib uniforms. Please. Please. Have some mercy on us all. With those bib uniforms. Okay, real quick. Uh, so Shams is tweeting about uh, the NBA schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure that we uh, I want to make sure that we get to this because I think this is a big deal. Um, two notable early season games: Box and Giannis open against the Sixers on the road, October twentieth. Celtics and Heat October twenty first in a rematch of the Eastern Conference Finals, and then on Martin Luther King Day. January 16th, Heat versus Hawks in Atlanta and Suns at Grizzlies in Memphis. So those are huge, huge. Yeah. Those are big games. Yeah. I mean, the NBA is definitely trying to match make here. You know, you're trying oh, to make big matches. No doubt. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think they are. Uh, Teddy Wayman with a $5 tip. Hey, guys, Alma just said he's meeting you today. I appreciate you hitting us up. The show is awesome. Yeah. Alma is meeting us today. At top secret. Top secret. It Take is it classified. Easy. Take it easy. I'm not trying to be cryptic. Yeah, Wayman Brothers Construction. You need a contractor. There's few better than Alma Wayman. Now, Teddy, mm, Teddy's a little questionable of character. You don't really want him in your home. The smell alone is a problem. Pack your shit. Let's I'm, go. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding, Teddy. <laughs> Joking with you. But, uh, yeah, Allman, uh, Wayman Brothers Construction, Alma Wayman and his crew yeah. have done a lot of work on my house. They don't advertise on the show, by the way, but... Uh, Teddy listens. I'm telling you, you need a contractor called Wayman Brothers because yep. uh, they're awesome. So I guess that's it. Speaking that's of it, meeting Alma, that's it, Skippy. Pack your stuff. Yeah. Um, tomorrow on the show, I'll save it. Tomorrow on the show, we'll have uh, we'll talk a lot more Salt Lake City sports right here on YouTube. Tune in. Yeah, a lot more coming up tomorrow on the show. Um, back to our normal ending. No meeting on the books. Um, I'll have the latest on the Jazz for you because I think there's there's going to be an announcement this week from the Jazz that I think is really interesting. We'll see what that is. We'll see what you guys think of that. More on college football. I have no idea. <laughs> Deshaun Watson. Oh, we didn't get to Deshaun today. 
tomorrow. Heated debate tomorrow. on Deshaun Watson. Heated because Jake and I are on opposite sides of the Deshaun Watson thing. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Make sure you go say hi to our friends at Barbecue Pit Stop. Any of their five Utah locations, Logan, Leighton, Lehigh, Murray, and St. George. Enter to win the BYU driveaway. It's on the box, in the box, on the counters at all Barbecue Pit Stops. Come join us at Lehigh on September 17th. And, of course, you need mortgage advice, real estate. Call my guy, Deborah Davis at Academy Mortgage, 801 543 Until tomorrow, say goodbye, Jake. Goodbye, Jake.